we're going to open the um, House bill, um, the public hearing on House Bill 618 FN, and recognize the prime sponsor, Representative Schroeder. Um, at this point, I would like to remind everybody to please turn the ringers off on your cell phones. Um, it is very disruptive during the public hearing process to have your cell phone go off. So again, please, as a courtesy to us and to the other uh, folks that are here today, either turn them off or turn them way down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Uh, there are two. Um, good morning, Madam Chair of the, of the committee. For the record, my name is Adam Schrader, and uh, I represent Rockingham County District 17, the towns of Newmarket and Newfields. There are many reasons I am proud to serve as the prime sponsor of House Bill 618, but I think the best argument for this bill is one that comes straight out of our New Hampshire Constitution. Part 1, Article 18 says, all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense. In other words, the punishment ought to fit the crime. Currently, possession of an ounce or less of marijuana is a Class A misdemeanor, punishable by up to a year in jail or a fine up to $2,000. All five other New England states have determined that harsh criminal penalties are not appropriate for simple possession of marijuana. Since we have not heard of problems resulting from these policies, I believe we in New Hampshire should now follow our neighbor's lead on this issue so that the limited resources available to our criminal justice system can be directed toward things that Granite Stairs are much more concerned about. Things like violent crime, property crime, and other serious threats to public safety. If we ask the people who voted us into office what they think about marijuana policy, the answer is clear. They support not only decriminalization, but outright legalization. The most recent Granite State poll conducted by the University of New Hampshire Survey Center found 59% support for legalization with only 35% opposed. But this bill does not legalize marijuana and it's very important that we understand it. As amended by the House, HB 618 simply reduces the penalty for possession of one half ounce or less of marijuana or five grams or less of hashish to a violation punishable by a fine of $100 for the first offense, $200 for a second offense, and $500 for third and subsequent offenses. In addition to decriminalizing possession of one half ounce or less of marijuana and five grams or less of hashish, House Bill 618 also reduces other maximum penalties for marijuana, again consistent with Article 18. Although felony penalties would be maintained for growing or selling marijuana, the maximum prison sentences for those felonies would be reduced. And you'll be able to see that in one of the handouts that I just uh, provided you. Um, going down the list, if everybody has it now, um, you see where the violation comes into play for one half ounce or less possession. For more than that, it remains a Class A misdemeanor under this bill. But for cultivating, manufacturing, selling, or possessing with intent to sell one ounce or less of marijuana, it remains a felony as well, which is punishable by up to three years in jail or a $25,000 fine. But then, moving forward, cultivating, selling, or possessing with intent to sell up to five pounds of marijuana or less than one pound of hashish the penalty is reduced from a felony with a uh, time of seven years in prison down to three years, the fine of $100,000 down to $25,000. And finally, um, for a greater amount than that, the felony is reduced from a prison sentence of 20 years down to seven years, and a fine of $300,000 down to up to $100,000. And um, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can, we can look at that and those penalties and comparing them with harsher drugs like heroin and see that um, there's re good reason to consider the reduced penalties in, in that regard. And these penalties, while reduced, are still very substantial felony penalties for anybody caught producing or selling marijuana. 
And then at this time, I'd like to turn to the language of the bill itself, if you guys have that as well. Um, before I begin, I wanted to thank, uh, wanted to tell you that there appear to be, have been a few oversights, uh, mainly stemming from when the House amended this bill, down from one ounce to one half ounce. Uh, many thanks to Senator Daniels uh, for reading the bill carefully and identifying a few of those problems. Um, I went ahead and uh, uh, prepared um, what could be a, a draft amendment yesterday that would clean up these mistakes so that uh, it's available if you would like to adopt it. But for now, I'll just uh, simply identify those mistakes as we go through. Um, page one of the bill begins with a new section creating the new violation penalties, which we just discussed. Um, then from line 10 um, to page two, line 17, um, we see new language for dealing with individuals who are under 18 and under 21. As we all know, one concern that has been raised about past decriminalization bills has been the message they send to young people. With House Bill 618, the message to young people is clear. Do not use marijuana. House Bill 618 strongly discourages marijuana use by persons under 21 by making it possible for a court to revoke their driver's license. As you can see in paragraph 3C, beginning on page 1, line 24, such offenders may, at the discretion of the court, be subject to the revocation or denial of a driver's license or privilege to drive for not more than one year on the first finding or conviction under this paragraph and not more than two years for a subsequent finding or conviction. For offenders under 18, the consequences are even more substantial. Those are found in 3B, beginning on page 1, line 12. <coughs> offenders, parents, or legal guardians shall be notified of the offense. The court may order the offender to participate in up to 35 hours of community service, which shall be completed within one year of the date of the offense. Further, the court may order the offender to complete an alcohol and substance abuse education program that has been approved by the Department of Health and Human Services at the offender's expense. An offender who fails to complete an alcohol and substance abuse education program or community service requirement as ordered um, may be subject to an additional fine of up to $300. So we did the best we could to come up with a reasonable process for dealing with underage offenders. In the House, there was interest in putting marijuana penalties for minors on par with alcohol penalties. And I believe we've done that here to the greatest extent possible. That said, this is one section of the bill where I and other supporters remain open to suggestion. We feel strongly that criminal penalties for youthful offenders would be counterproductive, but if somebody has a better idea than what is written here, I, for one, would certainly be interested in hearing it. Um, moving on to page two, Roman numeral four, lines 18 through 28. <clears throat> the idea of this section is that while we don't want individuals caught with small amounts of marijuana to receive a criminal record, we do want the state to do a better job collecting data on the number of citations and making that information available to the public. Roman numeral five spells out that under normal circumstances, an offender should not be arrested for simple possession. The exception is if the offender refuses to produce identification so that the officer can write a citation. In those cases, a person can be arrested. This section also contains the first oversight, or potential oversight. Line 35 refers to one ounce or less of marijuana, not one half ounce or less. The same issue appears on page 3, line 3. Now, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure this needs to be changed. If a person possessed, say, three quarters of an ounce of marijuana, would that be a misdemeanor and an arrestable offense under the House approved language of House Bill 618 with or without this change? If there's a concern that people will refuse to identify themselves and that it will not be clear to the officer if they are possessing more or less than half an ounce, you might just want to leave the language the way it is. Continuing on page three, Roman numeral six, 
makes it clear that no collateral consequences should befall a person whose only offense is possession of an ounce or less of marijuana. This language does not prevent police officers from investigating other crimes, particularly driving while impaired, which would remain a crime. Unfortunately, this section does contain one mistake. The reference in line five to RSA 263-56-B should be a reference to RSA 318-B-2-C, which contains new violations we would be creating by passing the bill. That mistake, fortunately, can be easily fixed. Uh, beginning on page three, line 20, you will see the plea by mail process, which should be pretty self-explanatory. We try to keep that process as simple as possible for both the person paying the fine and the courts. Uh, pages four and five deal with reducing of maximum penalties in the manner that we already discussed with the handout. And finally, at the bottom of page five, there is another error. Unfortunately, it's another one that can be fixed. The house simply failed to change references to one ounce to one half ounce. Line 34 should say in the case of more than one half ounce, and line 37 should say in the case of one half ounce or less. The bill concludes on page six with two clarifications that a person possessing one half ounce or less of marijuana should not be charged with crimes. Lines <clears throat> four and five exempt an ounce or less of marijuana from the criminal law against controlling any premises or vehicle where he knows a controlled drug or its analog is illegally kept or deposited. Additionally, lines six through 12 exempt one ounce or less of marijuana from the criminal law against possessing drugs while driving a motor vehicle. But again, I need to note that this does not make it legal for a person to drive while impaired. To conclude, I believe that we all understand that marijuana is not a harmless substance. But we should also understand, if we're honest with ourselves, that the harms associated with this plant are not sufficient to justify a criminal penalty for simple possession. If we are truly concerned about abuse of dangerous drugs like heroin, cocaine, Oxycontin, and meth, then those substances should be our focus and not marijuana. I would ask that you please vote ought to pass so we can allow police and prosecutors <coughs> to focus their limited resources on more serious crimes. For offenses involving simple marijuana possession, a fine would be just fine for New Hampshire. Thank you, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the committee? Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Um, the chair will call Representative Lachance. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senators. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to testify on this important bill. Um, for the record, my name is Joseph Lachance. I represent uh, the great city of Manchester, uh, Hillsborough District 8, which is Ward 1. I am a co-sponsor of this bill, and I'd like to take it from a different angle. I'd like to talk a little bit about the collateral damage that our laws, our current simple possession laws, create for people. I'd also like to give you a little bit of a background on myself. as a former police officer for 10 years, and having been a teacher, um, I've seen this. I'm also a father. One daughter in college and one in elementary. I've gone through the financial aid process. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what happens when this shows up on somebody's record. If you take a look at this first page, if you would, this is an actual screenshot from the Federal Student Aid website. Uh, my daughter is in college and we just redid her paperwork so she could go back to school. I direct you to the bottom portion where it says under highest school completed by parent number two. Then it starts asking some questions for financial aid. If you have children or you've gone through this process, you know the questions they ask. 
Uh, the first one, have you been convicted for the possession of illegal drugs or an offense that occurred while you're receiving federal student aids or grants? Um, this question is different for a first year student, a freshman student that would say have you ever been convicted? Because my daughter is now a sophomore, it asks were you convicted during the time you were receiving student aid? Uh, if she would have received a citation, excuse me, an arrest um, for simple marijuana possession, uh, she would have had to check yes and therefore eligibility for financial aid um, is terminated. If that happened in Maine, if that happened in Vermont, if that happened in Massachusetts or any of the other states around us, she'd be fine. But in New Hampshire, if we're caught with a simple marijuana cigarette or some paraphernalia, you may be charged and you may be facing a misdemeanor. And in New Hampshire, you may be marked for life. <coughs> in 2012, there were 2,728 marijuana arrests. Of these, 2,327, or 85.3%, were for simple possession, 85%. The estimated cost in New Hampshire is uh, $6,526,364 enforcing marijuana laws, and that would en uh, encompass police, the courts, the criminal justice, etc. <coughs> That's an awful lot of money we could be spending elsewhere. Uh, I think we all know uh, we, we certainly uh, could use the money and uh, we certainly could use law enforcement uh, focusing their efforts on something different than this. Uh, between 1990 and 2007, there were a total of 42,576 marijuana related arrests in New Hampshire. So in our, in our penalties, in our statutes, uh, it allows arrest, jail time, fines, and it creates an enormous challenge for these kids, folks, who are trying to move on to better themselves. May I give you a personal example? My second daughter is an adopted daughter. We adopted my daughter from Guatemala. It was a two-year process. That process included a background check, a credit check, and every other check known to mankind. If I would have been convicted in New Hampshire for possession of a marijuana cigarette, I mean, I'll have my daughter today. In Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, and many other states in the country, it wouldn't be an issue. In New Hampshire, it's an issue. Many of the state's largest employers conduct background investigations. If somebody were to make a mistake, or they got caught with a marijuana cigarette, they may lose out on that job. A nurse. Professional licensing. May not be able to get that license. There's a lot of different collateral damage that occurs when New Hampshire's uh, penalty for simple possession are put on our residents. A variety of New Hampshire occupational license may also be unavailable to people with misdemeanor conventions, like I just said. Um, collateral sanctions like this undermine an individual's access to education, public assistance, and housing. Through the process of civil asset forfeiture, police officers may seize property on the mere suspicion of marijuana possession. Collateral sanctions have the combined effect of seriously limiting an individual's professional advancement, employment opportunities, and personal life choices a number of years after that conviction. You know, as a police officer, um, an awful lot of time is spent. Uh, if you are arresting somebody for a simple marijuana possession, you're taking a police officer off the road for couple of hours, you gotta do a report, you gotta book them, you gotta get a bail commissioner in, um, and then the costs hand off to the courts at that point. Would it be easier just to give a ticket, a violation, and then move on 
and let's go after <laughs> crimes that we really need uh, to enforce uh, or we could spend the extra time looking for the crimes against other humans, robberies, um, hard drugs, heroin. Um, I think we're doing ourselves a $6,500,000 disservice by enforcing this by law enforcement, not to mention the collateral damage that we are causing our kids, um, our uh, young adults, and e you know, even uh, somebody who, who may be older. Um, I think it's time. I'd like to thank you folks for an open mind. I'd like to thank you for taking a look at this and realizing that we're not legalizing, we're not asking you to legalize marijuana. That's not what the case is. We are asking you to have the punishment fit the crime and prevent collateral damage from happening to our students, our children, and our great folks of the Grand State. Thank you. Now, ask me a question, Ms. Gurney. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Daniels. If someone uh, were, were stopped and fined $100 for having less than a half ounce, would that, a, would that not equate to a conviction? Thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, that is right. The question asks, are there any misdemeanor convictions, criminal convictions? A violation is not a criminal conviction, and therefore um, it would match up the penalties with the rest of um, the New England states and some of the other states where you would be eligible for financial aid. Follow-up? Yes, follow-up. Uh, reading off your student eligibility, if you are convicted of possessing or selling drugs uh, after you submit, it doesn't say criminal. I, said if you are convicted of possessing. Hmm. So my question is, if somebody were fined $100, and even though it's a violation, were they not convicted? Correct, because it, thank you, Senator. Um, if, my understanding of this is, if you would have uh, answered yes, another series of boxes would have come up, and would it, what happened, was it a misdemeanor, was it, you have to explain yourself. There are some exceptions, but a violation does not count um, for uh, federal student aid, but a misdemeanor would. And so, so <coughs> what we're missing here is the second page to show because, clarification? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, no, well, what happened was, because we don't have, this is my personal, uh, my daughter's page. Uh, we didn't click yes, obviously, so. I don't have another page to show you what would be there. Thank you. Are there any further questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Representative. Thank you. The chair will call on Representative Cushing. Okay. okay. Um, the chair will call on Representative Thal. Good morning, again. Good morning. Once again, for the record, my name is John Ethal Jr. I am the representative for Co-op District 5 and the chairman of the Criminal Justice Committee. I'd also like to point out that I'm also a police officer. I've been a police officer for some 43 years. And I'm also a recently appointed member to the Governor's Task Force on Drug and Alcohol Abuse. I appear here today in, in support of the uh, idea of decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana. In the 43 years I've been a police officer, I have never seen anyone go to jail for a small quantity of marijuana. It's routinely been a fine. I have some issues with the bill. For example, uh, I think that any penalty for <coughs> a small amount of marijuana should be equal to that for possession of alcohol by a minor, because if you look at the average fine for possession of alcohol is $250. If you get picked up for possession of marijuana under this bill, the first offense is $100, which tends to say it's better to be picked up for a small amount of marijuana than it is for a bottle of beer. Uh, my own personal preference is that the quantity is a little bit high. I would prefer to see somewhat less than a quarter of an ounce, possibly as low as an eighth of an ounce. 
However, I would like to uh, thank the sponsor and the members of the, of the sponsored the bill because their intent is, is perfectly well and they were more than willing to work with the committee to try and make it a better bill. Uh, I had intended to point out some of the flaws in the, in the bill as it came through, but the sponsor has already pointed out there are places in the bill where it uh, seems to be uh, diametrically opposite of what the intent of the bill was. Um, Basically, uh, my feeling is that, as the sponsor had indicated, he wanted it, it, it to be uh, comparable to alcohol violation, and uh, I believe that a, a, a violation level offense for a small quantity of marijuana is not an inappropriate thing. I would also like to point out, however, that just because it's a misdemeanor offense doesn't mean you're arrested in your book. The law allows for summons and place in lieu of arrest. So the actual time spent on a minor marijuana violation is not necessarily several hours. It could be as little as 15 or 20 minutes. Okay. Are there any questions um, from Representative Paul? Senator Cotongo. Thank you. Representative, uh, with your experience and so forth, does marijuana lead to something higher for a person? I'm not an expert at that. I know that there are some people that when they're questioned about their uh, drug history, they started out with marijuana and worked their way up. Um, I wouldn't say that it would be that way for everybody, just as smoking a cigarette for somebody, doesn't, they don't become addicted to it right off if they, if they try to do that. But I can't, I'm not an expert on that line, I can't really tell you. We'll follow up. Follow up. We have a heroin problem, I understand, here in New Hampshire. Are you an expert? Uh -huh. No, I'm not. I have a, a few questions, Representative, and I hope you'll indulge my, uh, my question. Of course. Um, you had mentioned that you would like to see the amount reduced from a half an ounce to perhaps a quarter or an eighth of an ounce. Could you tell me, uh, in your experience as a police officer, uh, how many marijuana cigarettes can be made from a half an ounce of marijuana? Approximately 30. 30, okay. Um, could you tell me in a quarter ounce? My guess would be approximately 15. Okay, and an eighth? Would be half again. Half of the count? Seven, 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 eight. Okay. Um, in looking at some of the um, uh, marijuana penalties here in New Hampshire, I've noticed that for the cultivating manufacturer selling or possessing with an intent to sell one ounce or less, um, is felony up to three years and a $25,000 fine, but it also tries to reduce the penalty for uh, selling, manufacturing selling or possessing with intent to sell it for five pounds um, and makes them the same. Um, it reduces the felony from seven years to three years. Do you think that's appropriate? Um, I would believe that would have been three and a half to seven, okay. but I'm not, I'm not sure, but I am. I think that's a decision that uh, you you would be better made than I because I tend to believe that the penalties for manufacturing and selling is uh, should say where they are. Okay. The final question that I have concerns hashish. Do you believe hashish should be included in this, or should this just deal with marijuana? I think the intent of the bill is to deal with marijuana, but I think the hashish was included because of the way the statute is written now. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the chair will call Sarah Sadowski. Hello, and thank you for your time. For the record, my name is Sarah Sadowski. I work at communi uh, the Community Engagement Director for New Futures. We work on policy issues related to reducing substance use in New Hampshire. We, are also, we would like to acknowledge that improvements have been made in this bill. However, House Bill 618 still would have a negative impact on public health, particularly for youth. The amount of marijuana permitted in this bill exceeds a reasonable amount for personal use, we feel, and we are particularly concerned with the consequences post page four. I think that this is definitely a bill that's not just about questions of personal use. And we would not like to see those penalties change. 
You'll be hearing today from youth work, folks who work with youth, families, um, and they can speak to their concerns perhaps better than I could. Uh, we would also say that this is not likely to reduce costs, I think, to the degree that's been estimated uh, because of the nature of the fact it's not usually just a marijuana charge. So, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Sadowski? Seeing none, thank you. Um, the chair will call um, Annika Stanley Smith. <coughs> Hello, um, and thank you for having us today, and thank you for taking the time to um, let us speak to this. Uh, my name is Annika Stanley Smith. I'm a substance misuse prevention coordinator for the Capital Area Public Health Network, and I live in Goffstown. Um, part of the work I do for the community is developing and maintaining groups of youth volunteers at area high schools um, to, whose focus is to reduce substance misuse among their peers. Um, so I'd like to share with you some facts about New Hampshire currently. Um, we rank ninth in the U.S. in past 30-day marijuana use for youth ages 12 to 17. Um, studies show that the younger someone uses a substance, the more likely they are to get addicted. Um, so uh, just for example, compared to those who started using cannabis at age 21, um, participants who use cannabis before the age of 14 were four times more likely to become dependent. And when youth marijuana use does go up, it impacts the whole community. Um, high levels of marijuana use are related to poor educational outcomes, are related to lower income, are related to greater welfare dependence, and are related to unemployment. Um, another issue that the Capital Area Public Health Network sees with this current bill is the provisions that it provides for um, getting services if someone, if the court does declare that someone needs to find alcohol and substance misuse treatment. Currently, um, you can see those in lines 17 through 19 and lines 29 through 30. Um, so offenders can be ordered by the court to complete an alcohol and substance abuse education program, and those don't exist. Um, they, they are not probably going to exist in the next few years, as you can see by budget cuts that are happening currently. It's not provided for, and there is no one who can currently provide those services. As someone who works in the community, I try and make the best use of every dollar I have, but where I'm better qualified and where I can better make an impact is in preventative work. And when we open the floodgates, like this bill will do, to our youth, my job gets a lot harder. So I'm obviously here for some selfish reasons, but I want you to please consider the impact that this will help on, have on our youth, on our economy, and I thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Patel. Are you opposed to the bill? I am opposed to the bill, yes. Follow-up? Follow-up. Uh, I asked a question earlier, does Matt Warner and your expertise and your knowledge lead to something higher for gratification? I, off the top of my head, I can't quote to you scientific data, and I prefer to speak that way. Anecdotally, we do see a lot of most people who go on to use other drugs start with marijuana use, like previously stated. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any further questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. The chair will call Matt Simon. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Simon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. <coughs> Matt Simon, I'm the New England Political Director for the Marijuana Policy Project in the Boston. I've given you quite a bit of written testimony. There are a couple of these documents that I'll actually refer to. Um, but just to begin generally, polls consistently show the public opinion <coughs> sharply against the prohibition of marijuana. Four states have voted to legalize and regulate marijuana production and sale. The District of Columbia has legalized possession of home cultivation for adults 21 and over. An additional 15 states have decriminalized possession, including all five New England states. 
I think this strong shift in opinion has happened for basically two reasons. One is that Americans and Granite Staters have realized that marijuana is not the extremely dangerous substance that it's been cracked up to be. When I was a kid in the 80s, we learned it kills brain cells. <coughs> we learned that it has no positive benefits whatsoever. It was placed right in the same category with heroin and methamphetamine. And at the same time, we had drugs like alcohol and drugs like tobacco that were killing millions of people that were not even really treated like drugs at all. So I think reassessing marijuana policy requires that we look at the harms and benefits of marijuana as objectively as possible and try to separate fact and fiction. But beyond that, regardless of whether marijuana is extremely harmful or not, prohibition simply hasn't been effective in reducing use and it has created some very significant negative consequences for society. So we've heard the growing majority of grant states favor legalization. That's obviously not what we're talking about here. 11 states decriminalized in the 1970s, and when they did so, they were implementing the recommendations of President Nixon's own hand-picked commission on national, uh, national Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse. It's chaired by Raymond Schaefer, the former uh, Republican governor of Pennsylvania. And one of the bits I've given you is uh, one page written testimony from law professor Richard Bonney, who was the lead researcher for the Schaefer Commission. Uh, I was happy to submit a written testimony to you. He's quite surprised that we're, we're still criminalizing hundreds of thousands of Americans for using marijuana. Um, so I want to turn to the teen use. And uh, I have two handouts dealing specifically with teens. One is the American Academy of Pediatrics, one pager, some quotes from a recent report issued by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they strongly endorse decriminalization. They do not support legalization, but they very specifically say, one, that decriminalization of recreational use of marijuana by adults has not led to an increase in use, rate, use, use rates. And we should be educating. We should be trying to steer young people away from using marijuana. And when they do develop problems, we should try to help them get treatment. Scaring them with a criminal penalty is not proven to be the most effective way of doing that. So next I'd like to turn to the one that says, do harsh penalties for marijuana possession reduce teen use? And this is a handout I created several years ago, and I update it every year when the new numbers are released from the federal surveys. And I'll spend just a minute on this because I think it's really important. First of all, Mississippi and Alabama, two states far from us, but two states which are very similar in many ways. I went to college in Mississippi and we're, we're very similar size, similar culture, similar <coughs> population. One big difference, Mississippi decriminalized marijuana possession in 1976. Alabama maintained a very harsh criminal penalty for marijuana possession to this day. And if you look at the chart on page two, you'll see that both states are well below the national average. People in the deep south don't use marijuana at high rates. I think they smoke cigarettes at higher rates than we do. I think they, uh, there's a lot of drinking and some other problems. But marijuana use is lower than the national average, whether you decriminalize or whether you maintain a harsh penalty. And in many of these years, Mississippi's lower than Alabama, despite having decriminalized. There's a similar chart on the next page, looking at some states in middle, middle America. All of them are well below the national average, regardless of what their penalties are. Nebraska is the one state that's decriminalized. It's well below the national average, just like Kansas and South Dakota. Most relevantly to us, I think, is the northern New England charts on the last page. <clears throat> so of the, six New, of the New England states, Maine has, first of all, decriminalized in 1976. And Incidentally, the amount that is decriminalized in Maine is now two and a half ounces. It was 1.25 ounces, and they increased it to two and a half ounces a few years ago because they wanted to expand the number of people who would not be criminally <coughs> liable. Maine also was the first New England state to have a medical marijuana law, and they have by far the most robust medical marijuana law. They have eight dispensaries, and it's the state where Patients aren't even required to register 
with the state and name, so we don't know how many patients are registered. In Vermont, there are 1,700 patients registered in the entire state. It's a very restricted program. In Maine, most people think it's over 20,000 patients who have a doctor's recommendation and are legally using, growing, or whatever. I know that's not directly relevant to this, but Maine has the lowest teen use rate, or very nearly the, the lowest teen use rate, uh, depending on which survey you look, you look at in New England. According to the, uh, the, the youth risk behavior surveillance system numbers, Maine is actually the only state out of Maine, Mass, New Hampshire, and Vermont that is below the national average in terms of teen use. So my testimony refers to a few specific studies that were done by independent researchers. These are the actual numbers that I put in the charts, but the story is very clear. We don't know yet what Colorado's legalization is gonna to do to teen use rates. Some think it will go up, some think it will go down because you're regulating it in quarantine. That's irrelevant to this. We've seen a number of states that have reduced penalties to a violation and they have not experienced those spikes. <clears throat> I'm gonna to turn to also a law enforcement and uh, this one. Or police chiefs on marijuana decriminalization, will it unleash a wave of devastation or is it a pragmatic answer to injustice? And those are both quotes that we've heard from New Hampshire police chiefs in recent years. Um, my point simply is I respect the position of the Police Chiefs Association if they're opposed to this bill, but they don't speak for all the police chiefs in New Hampshire. Uh, when one of the, the police chiefs did run for state senate, Last year, he put out a very strong statement in favor of decriminalization, called it a pragmatic answer to injustice. What is all mistake and the rest of your life is marginalized, the punishment does not fit the crime. Similarly, in jurisdictions such as D.C., we've seen voters pass decriminalization laws. D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier was not a supporter of decriminalization, but it passed, and after it passed, she said, well, it saves us from having to charge someone for small amounts of marijuana now because it really never was productive to begin with. It's a little bit easier for us, actually. And then a month later, she went further. Uh, she said, all those, all those marijuana arrests do is make people hate us. Alcohol is a much bigger problem. Similarly, in Vermont, I, I worked on trying to pass decriminalization in Vermont in 2012 and 13. And the strongest opponent was uh, Virgin's police chief, George Merkel, who's president of the Chiefs Association in Vermont. In 2012 and 13, Chief Merkel couldn't believe, he, he was upset that, that the legislature was even considering decriminalization. The law was signed in uh, July of 2013, and since then, in public appearances over the last couple months, uh, Vermont's debating legalization, Chief Merkel has said the law, the decrim law has been workable, and he's quoted in the Rutland Herald saying, kids make mistakes. We all think we're indestructible when we're young. I don't want to see any kids like ruined because of a poor choice. I'd rather see them go through diversion or something rather than criminal court. So we have seen people be very concerned and then decriminalization laws pass. They realize it's just a reduction of penalties and some law enforcement end up saying, this actually makes our jobs easier, not harder. Speaking of Vermont, uh, a lot of questions about what are the impacts of decriminalization. The Rand Corporation did a detailed study in Vermont of the whole picture issue of marijuana policy and legalization. But they, they analyzed the effects of the decrim law. And what they found was that there were 80% fewer <coughs> criminal cases af after the law was implemented. But there were actually 20% total increase in marijuana possession cases uh, that police were writing more tickets when their choice was arrest somebody, charge them with a crime, or do nothing. Often they were doing nothing because as we hear anecdotally from people, I, you know, I hear from people all the time and say, I've been caught with marijuana five times, 10 times, and nothing's ever happened to me, they just let me go. So we know that happens anecdotally. Uh, but it appears that in Vermont that reducing the penalty to something that does fit the crime has been beneficial. The police are happier to write those tickets than they were to commit themselves to 
going through with the paperwork of, of uh, a criminal charge. Another factor that hasn't been brought up that I think is relevant, um, all three states bordering New Hampshire are poised to potentially legalize and regulate the production of sale of marijuana next year. Um, in Massachusetts and Maine, it's very likely and expected to be on the ballot in November of 2016. Ballot initiatives uh, similar to what's passed in Colorado that would have marijuana stores, marijuana growing, cultivation, and sale being regulated. In Vermont, uh, the legislature has commissioned a detailed report from the Rand Corporation. They've got a Senate committee meeting every Friday afternoon trying to figure out what is the Vermont way to legalize marijuana. It's not going to happen this year, but uh, there's reason to believe it may happen next year through the legislature. If all three of those laws pass, New Hampshire could be surrounded by states where marijuana is legal and where stores are popping up, even if only one of them passes. Uh, very likely that New Hampshire voters or residents will be able to <coughs> purchase marijuana, bring it back across the border into New Hampshire, and then be committing a, a crime. And at that point, I think. If it's not already absurd to be arresting people and prosecuting them uh, for a criminal offense for possession, I think at that point it, it would clearly be absurd. <clears throat> Some might say we've already passed a medical marijuana law, so why would we decriminalize quote unquote recreational users? <clears throat> and to that I would point out that New Hampshire's medical marijuana law is one of the most restrictive in the nation. I mentioned Vermont's law having 1,700 patients registered in the state. <clears throat> um, we, Vermont's law is less restrictive than ours. Uh, patients with severe pain can qualify in Vermont without having to link it to one of the specific conditions on the handout. But I think we can expect a similar sign-up rate in Vermont. One type of patient that won't be able to qualify is a chronic pain patient. New Hampshire's law requires severe pain that hasn't been adequately treated uh, by other methods over a period of time. It's a very high standard. And similarly, uh, post-traumatic stress is not uh, included in New Hampshire's law. There are now 11 states that allow medical marijuana as a treatment for post-traumatic stress. I've heard from countless combat veterans, victims of violent crime, et cetera, who say being able to use a little bit of marijuana before they go to sleep is what keeps them from having terrible nightmares, is what keeps them from being up all night, some credit it with being the reason they're alive, the reason they haven't committed suicide. <coughs> I know that's all anecdotal. There's a study trying to look at PTSD in combat veterans that will involve actual veterans using actual marijuana. It's gotten all the approvals. It's been in the pipeline for about eight years. I hope that study finally happens this year or next so we can get some real data to corroborate what all these veterans and others have been telling us. But just as far as chronic, <coughs> chronic pain goes, um, at, at this point, Mr. Simon, I'm, I'm going to ask you to. I'm almost to, done. I want to get to the heroin. Really get to your um, your comments concerning the bill. We're not here to discuss medicinal marijuana um, and our current law. We've got a bill in front of us to decriminalize marijuana, which I think is a different subject. So if you could keep your yes, comments Chair. to the bill. My point, uh, my point, I was hoping to make with that is. We do have a great deal of evidence that people are benefiting from marijuana abuse with chronic pain, that they require less opiates, and in many cases, they're able to substitute marijuana entirely for opiates. And getting back to Senator Cataldo's question about heroin and, and opiate overdoses, some people see that as a reason not to decriminalize possession. I'm thinking of the thousands of chronic pain patients in New Hampshire, some of whom are already benefiting from medical cannabis who would be charged with a crime for doing that, and I think the violation would be much more appropriate. There's a study last year published in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that states with effective medical marijuana laws have 25% fewer overdose deaths than states without such laws, and yet we have passed such a restricted medical marijuana law. I don't think we'll see that benefit. Um, so, cutting right to the 
couple of things that have said. I would disagree with uh, Representative Fall's number of joints per ounce. The National Institute on Drug Abuse rolls its own marijuana cigarettes for use in research and uh, for federal medical marijuana patients. I've seen their cigarettes. They look like cigarettes. They're average size. They're 0.85 grams each, give or take. That adds up to 33 to 34 joints in a full ounce, so 16 or so and a half ounce. And I think that's about right. Joints have become much less popular over the years, by the way. But, um, with regard to the, the penalties in the bill for the, the felony penalties for larger amounts, um, I'm, I'm honestly not sure those are going to have any impact in the real world if they were to pass. Uh, courts don't want to throw people in jail for 20, year, uh, 20 years over marijuana. <laughs> there was a case in Vermont a couple weeks ago in federal court. A Montgomery man described as a kingpin in an international marijuana traffic operation and was sentenced to 30 months in prison. So we're, we're seeing courts incredibly, increasingly looking at this from a limited resources perspective. How much money do we really want to spend to keep somebody behind bars? But that said, the main point of this bill, the main impact of this bill will be for people who are simply possessing small amounts. Uh, about 2,300 arrests a year for simple <coughs> possession, and the supporters of this bill will reduce that number to as close to zero as possible. So the committee wanted to take out all of that language about the felonies. I, I, would, I would be a little sad, but it, it really is not the point of this bill. If that's a sticking point, please take that. Um, we want to stop people from being arrested for a small amount. <coughs> and I've reached the bottom of my page, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions? Senator Cataldo. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> kind of looking over and listening to what you've been talking about, the question comes about with marijuana going to something higher. Does the pusher who sells marijuana, now push that person towards cocaine or something else. It's possible. And I did include a one-pager, I hope you saw it, asks, is marijuana a gateway drug? And the Institute of Medicine commented on specifically that issue. They said marijuana is uh, not, there's no conclusive evidence that uh, the drug effects of marijuana are causally linked to the subsequent abuse of other illicit drugs. Doesn't appear to be a gateway drug to the extent that it's the cause or even it's the most significant predictor of serious drug abuse. No evidence that it serves as a stepping stone on the basis of, the basis of its particular physiological effect. Instead, the legal status of marijuana may make it a gateway drug. So the fact that we're not regulating it in a marijuana uh, deal oh, may introduce somebody to harder substances. Yes, I did read that already. Thank you very much. Is it a gateway? Will that person now, the pusher, who's pushing the marijuana, will now push that person off the heroin or something higher? I don't accept the premise that everybody who sells marijuana is a pusher. Um, I, I think people believe they have a right to use this substance, and I believe people have a right to use this substance. It has to come from somewhere. Uh, but some marijuana dealers almost certainly are pushers, and they may have a much better profit margin to the people on more dangerous drugs, and that is a concern. Are there any further questions for Mr. Snow? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Snow. Thank you. Um, the chair will call John M. Carnacio.
Thank you. Good morning, members of the, of the committee. My name is John Antonasio. I'm a lieutenant with the New Hampshire State Police, and I am currently the commander of the Narcotics and Investigations Unit. I am here today representing the New Hampshire Department of Safety. We are opposed to House Bill 618. I have brought with me a position paper stating a number of reasons for the Department's position on this bill. I have testified before many, many of you in years past, and our position remains the same. The reasons for our position are outlined in the paper. So in the essence of time, I will simply highlight a few main concerns. This bill reduces the penalty for possession of one half ounce or less of marijuana or five grams or less of hashish, which is a more potent form of marijuana, to a violation. The penalty for adults for such possession would be $100 for first offense, $200 for second, $300 for, for a third offense. It is important to know what one half ounce of marijuana is. One half ounce of marijuana is equivalent to approximately 28 average sized marijuana cigarettes. To put that in perspective, I brought with me today one half ounce of marijuana from our evidence line. You can see this is not the minimal amount it sounds like. One half ounce of marijuana is enough marijuana to get approximately 28 people high or one person high 28 times. Additionally, the change in the bill regarding issuing summonses would still create a court cost, although possibly not as high <coughs> as having actual trials. Someone who is issued a summons is still allowed to <coughs> contest that summons and possibly go to court. So the elimination of court costs is simply not true. This bill contains language that no record of the violation could be recorded on any publicly available criminal database or shared with federal or out-of-state law enforcement agencies. This could be problematic in tracking subsequent offenses. Additionally, it would force, the way that I'm looking at it, the Department of Safety or another branch to create an actual database. I just don't see how that's going to be cost effective. Also, the provision of law that provides for the revocation of an individual's driver's license for a person who drives a vehicle while having his or, in his or her possession any or in any part of the vehicle, marijuana or hashish is being repealed. Because of a lack of chemical tests and chemical test standards for marijuana, this is this particular law has been one of the few ways to keep drivers that are high off the public roads. Other states that have legalized marijuana are now seeing results in increased drug-related highway deaths and injuries. There are lessons to be learned from the experience of other states. California was the first state to legalize medical marijuana. Since then, the use of marijuana among the population has exploded along with the marijuana's potency. The THC level of marijuana in the 1990s averaged 4%. The THC level of today's marijuana averages close to 20%. A report from the Rocky Mountain Haida indicates the following regarding legalization of marijuana in Colorado. And I provided a copy of that report, which you can also get online. And additionally, there's a summary. Traffic fatalities involving operators testing positive for marijuana have increased 100% from 2007 to 2012. The majority of driving under the influence of drug arrests involved marijuana, and 25 to 40% were marijuana alone. Toxicology reports with positive marijuana results for driving under the influence have increased 16% from 2011 to 2013. Youth marijuana use has increased. Adult marijuana use has increased. 
From 2011 to 2013, there was a 57% increase in marijuana-related emergency room visits. Hospitalizations related to marijuana have increased 82% from 2008 to 2013. Marijuana-related exposures for children ages 0 to 5 average, on average have increased 268% from 2006 through 2013. Colorado's rate of marijuana-related exposures is triple the national average. Over the last nine years, the top three drugs involved in treatment admissions have been alcohol, marijuana, and amphetamines. <clears throat> Overall, crime in Denver has increased 6.7% from the first months, excuse me, from the first six months of 2013 to the first six months of 2014. Some have said that legalizing mar marijuana and taxing it will solve our budget problems. Sure, there will, be, there will certainly be money to be made, but at what cost? What can we learn from our experience with alcohol? Society makes millions of dollars per year taxing alcohol, but loses billions in associated costs, costs of health care, criminal justice, and treatment. What will the cost be to society? Should we add another substance to this list? Additionally, I have some charts and some statistics. Uh, this is an article from uh, Lessons from Colorado. There's a number of different statistics. And again, I, I don't have copies for every member of the committee. I will give you this one. You can make copies for yourself or you can get online. Uh, but I'd like to point out that this one shot, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. <clears throat> indicates that teen use of marijuana is higher in medical marijuana states. Now this is medical marijuana states, which we have just become, not to mention states that have decriminalized or legalized marijuana. Past month, marijuana users age 12 to 17, New Hampshire rates number two. At this point, I will take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody? I have one. Isn't it addictive to doing marijuana and bringing it to something higher and make the, make the person get higher? Yeah. Do you know what? Do I, can you repeat that, sir? I think it was a two-black Does, does marijuana become addictive so that you go to something higher? It can be. Mar marijuana can be addictive. Some people have found it addictive. Others have not. In regards to being a gateway drug and going to something additional, I can answer that. Not everybody who uses marijuana will become a cocaine user or a heroin user. However, most people that we have dealt with, we have interviewed, we have come in contact with that are heroin users have been marijuana users in the past. Any other questions? Thank you very much for time. <coughs> Have one more question, uh, Joe Hardy. Department of Health Human Services. Could you state your name for the committee? Yes, uh, my name is Joe Hardy, and I serve as the director for the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services at the Department of Health and Human Services. And I wanted to point out that on lines. 17 of the bill uh, includes language that says, further the court may order the offender to complete an alcohol substance abuse education program that has been approved by the Department of Health and Human Services at the offender's expense. I just want to point out, as it was earlier, that there are no such programs. Uh, <clears throat> the committee may want to consider uh, substituting that language that the court may order the offender to complete an alcohol and substance abuse evaluation and with the rest of that sentence. So I wanted to bring that to the committee's attention. Okay, what line was that? Uh, that's line 17 on the first page. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your Thank testimony you. this morning. Are there any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. The chair, let's see, um, we'll call uh, Mark Sisti. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is Mark Sisti, for the record. I'm a criminal defense attorney and have been in the state of New Hampshire for 36 years. I'm proud to say that I've practiced in every district court and every superior court in the state, and I've represented folks both indigent and very wealthy that have been charged with the simple possession of marijuana. I'd like to address the reality of what's going on out there with you folks. <coughs> I don't want to sugarcoat things, and I don't want to exaggerate. The bottom line, from what we see, is that if you get an attorney in the state of New Hampshire, whether it be an assigned attorney, or whether it be an attorney that costs thousands and thousands of dollars, you will not go to jail. That's one you generally will not be convicted of a crime of simple possession of marijuana. However, if you do not have the money to hire an attorney, you may be charged with a Class B misdemeanor. Class B misdemeanor of possession of marijuana, whether it be a joint, whether it be just a smidgen of marijuana, a Class B misdemeanor is a crime crime that is a very ugly tattoo that is very, very difficult to erase over time. And generally the folks that are charged with Class B misdemeanors enter into court alone. Sometimes they come from socioeconomic classes that are those of the un undereducated, the poor. And they walk into court and they think they're getting a good deal when the prosecutor or the police officer offers them a plea with a suspended fine and no going to jail. It is the worst deal that they could ever get. Because what they have done is they have begun a process for themselves that is going to end up, in essence, in taking them down a very, very ugly path. Whether it be a job application, whether it be a financial aid application, they're going to be labeled. And this state is labeling a lot of people. It's labeling a lot of people. And it's also causing a great deal of anxiety for normal, middle class folks that are trying to raise children, trying to do the right thing in society, trying to pay taxes, trying to be good citizens. They get charged with the simple possession of marijuana, they are on the same playing field as everybody else in a criminal courtroom. And that, that is not a pretty playing field. You know, a lot of times we, we talk in these, in these meetings about hypotheticals and, and, and it's so academic. The reality is that it is a scary event when parents bring their kids into our offices and share with us their anxiety about our little kid, our son or our daughter isn't going to go to college now. Our son or our daughter is, is never going to get the job or, or the profession that they sought. Or that the 22 or the 23 year old adult comes in crying, saying that they lost their job because they were charged with a criminal offense of possession of marijuana. Possession. Now, you know, for us to just turn our heads and say, well, you know, they deserve it or this or that, I think is, is something we have to address too. <coughs> there are a couple other criminal defense attorneys here today. And I can tell you that over the 36 years that I have represented individuals in courtrooms charged with simple possession of marijuana, very few of them, if any that I can just a simple possession, a joint, let's say, a joint, even get convicted 
of the missing. And I sit back and I go, why do we have it on the books? Why aren't we funneling our attention and our focus into something productive rather than waving around the 318B26 penalties with regard to marijuana? They are ineffectual. They are ineffectual. It is time to take it off the book and to address what we really should be addressing. This isn't a bill. I don't think, I don't think anybody in this room advocates people under, the 20, under 21 using marijuana. And that's not what this bill is, is trying to advocate. It's trying to lessen the blow for those caught in that particular net, certainly. Because I can assure you, I can assure you, that the majority of the kids under the age of 21 are going to experiment with marijuana. They're going to do it, just like they're going to have a sip of beer. They're going to do it. But the difference in, 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 in the future for those folks that had a beer one night and those folks caught with half a joint one night, the difference is astronomical. I mean, you're talking about two different time zones here. And it's not fair. And it's not just. And you know what? It cuts across the integrity of our criminal justice system. When somebody can walk into a courtroom with me, charged with a class A or B misdemeanor, and walk out with no conviction, and somebody walks into a courtroom alone and walks out with no conviction, that's not right. And what, that's what's going on. And I think it's important for you folks to understand but that's the reality of what's going on. That's what's happening. And it's creating two different classes of people as we continue down this road. So I guess what I'm asking you folks to understand is that we should have an equal and a fair playing field. And I can also tell you that I, I know that Senator Cattell has been uh, asking almost every speaker about uh, addiction and does it lead to uh, you know, a greater use of, I don't know, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine. There's, there's nothing there. I've been doing this for three and a half decades, and the two don't link. They don't grab hands and go merrily down, down the path. Folks that want to do heroin and, and maintain a high level of narcotic or opiate addiction, they're going to do it. And the two don't go hand in hand. I can guarantee you that everybody that is a heroin addict probably had a beer, too. And a lot of them bought them on the highway in the state of New Hampshire. So, I mean, that, that, those, those, I think, have to be disengaged. I, I think that when, when we're talking about marijuana, you're talking about a completely different substance. Uh, you know, you've heard the statistics that 70 or 71% of the population of the state of New Hampshire advocates this particular bill, basically, or even more legalization. There have been comparisons to other states, and, you know, the interesting thing is I, I've actually traveled to those other states. And, uh, I just got back from Denver, and uh, I left the airport. I should have grabbed the Denver Post that morning. It was a Sunday morning. Because the Denver Post was bemoaning two major <coughs> problems in the state of Colorado. And it wasn't addiction to greater drugs than marijuana. It certainly wasn't traffic deaths because of marijuana intoxication. It wasn't uh, violent crime because uh, they have legalized marijuana. I was talking to Matt Simon about it just before I came in. I found it amazing. They were bemoaning the fact that they had collected more tax revenue than they had anticipated and didn't know how to fairly distribute it. That was the headline. Below the fold, they were bemoaning the fact that building had taken off at such a great rate that they did not have enough skilled construction workers demand each and every one of the jobs that they need. So I'm gonna, I, I don't want to talk about legalization, but I have to tell you that there is a great positive side to what's going on in that particular experiment. And that's not what we're dealing with. I think that we have to take this in increments. I think that a realistic increment is to decriminalize. Because in essence, that's what we have done already. Now, sorry, uh, We've, we've heard from uh, uh, different directors and different police officers, and you're getting different opinions back and forth. 
it's interesting to note that I, I, I doubt whether anybody in any law enforcement agency will ever tell you that anybody is going to go to jail, jail, for the possession of a joint. No matter if you can roll 28 of them and a half ounce or 60 of them and a half ounce, this is not going to happen. So if it's not going to happen, why are we out there with a the false threat? Why are we waving around a saber and never using it? Why don't we just call it what it is? I mean, the reality has distilled itself down to what it is, and that's decriminalization de facto. Why don't we just make it the law and get on with it and deal with it and deal with bigger problems like the ones that we would like the legislature to deal with, and that is give our clients treatment for opiate addictions and heroin addictions and methamphetamine problems. That's where the guts of the drug problem is. Marijuana possession in small amounts is not a problem, and law enforcement knows it as well. That's the sum and substance of my testimony, but it would be open to any questions. Okay. Thank you yes. very much for your testimony this morning. Uh, Senator Capaldo has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me read something. Marijuana advocates we found that saying that marijuana is not addictive, but the truth is that one of 11 adults who have tried it and one of six adults who have ever used it find themselves in its grip. My question is, is it addictive? Does it, bring to, does it go to something higher? And will the person lose their job because of it? Well, I just came back from a state where thousands and thousands and thousands of people use it. I didn't see a lot of cocaine and methamphetamine use. I saw people that were responsible adults going into stores by the way, like one that my daughter operates in Denver, in a very orderly and a very, very sophisticated presence there, purchasing a product that has been highly regulated by the state of Colorado, leaving the store and going to their own homes and utilizing it in the, in the safety of their own homes, thereby cutting off the street vendors and, as you stated, pushers of marijuana. You don't see public use of marijuana in Denver. You don't see street vendors of marijuana in Denver. What you see is the purchase, in essence, of a product like one would purchase alcohol and then going to the privacy of their own homes and utilizing it in a responsible manner. <laughs> there is nothing that is indicating that there has been an increase in, quote, addiction and end quote, or the moving on to harsher drugs. And in fact, uh, one of the advocates of, of legalizing marijuana in Denver was the chief of police himself, all right, so that they could address the problems that you're, you're, you're alluding to, and that is the harsher, more difficult drugs and what that leads to. So I, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, I'm certainly not a doctor. I'm not let, sure. let me do a follow-up. So, so responsible manner. Yes. If I see three people that I have seen in my life started off with marijuana, came in late to work, the next day they came in late again, then with the cocaine about two weeks later, and then they came in an hour late, and then two hours late, and they finally get terminated, they were fired, okay? So what was the root cause of that problem? Was it marijuana or was it cocaine? I don't know what it is. I don't know who these people are, and I certainly can't speak to what their problems are. It could have been you know, bad parenting when they were children. It could be being undereducated. It could be anything, all right? I have no idea why your people that you saw somehow came to work late on more than one occasion or somehow escalated use into cocaine. I, I have no idea. And I, I, I can't speculate. I would hope that this committee won't speculate on anything like that. Uh, because frankly, you should know that there's a great deal of marijuana use in the state of New Hampshire. Most of it is undetected. Most of these folks don't have to go to court, and most of them function perfectly well day to day. I would assert, just for a moment, that if you tested like every construction worker in the state of New Hampshire for traces of marijuana, THC, you probably wouldn't be building too many buildings. One follow-up question. One more. Oh. You're driving down route for, over the highway here, over the Merrimack River Bridge, and there's a woman with a cigarette in her hand, but it's actually, it's a joint, all right, and she's texting with the other hand. Do we have a problem with that? Of course we have a problem with that. No, we don't. 
why, why don't we have a problem with people texting? If it's okay. legalized, the follow up, is it legalized, what difference does it make? Again, I, I don't understand the question, I suppose. If somebody's yes. smoking marijuana and texting, is that I'll let it go. We'll let, we'll let that yes. question. Okay. Are there any further questions for attorney assisting? Seeing none, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. The chair will call Representative Robertson. At this point, Representative, we've had a lot of testimony this morning, so we're interested in hearing something new. So hopefully you have something new to, to uh, I will offer do us. my best. Thank you so much. I'm Jim Robertson. I represent uh, Ward 3 in Keene, or Cheshire 6. Uh, I think I put the first marijuana bill in 20 odd years ago. And uh, like all of you, I believe terrible things about marijuana. And uh, a person I was associated with one summer said, Tim, you're talking like it's alcohol, and it isn't. Let me get you high. And I had been high a few times on alcohol during my college and army years, and uh, I certainly knew what I thought of as high. He got me some marijuana, we smoked together, and I said, this is not high, it just feels very pleasant. And he said, yes, Tim, that's what marijuana does. It doesn't attack the same parts of your brain as alcohol. But we use the same words, high, stone, all those things. But you're not. And, and the other word I have a problem with in here is addiction. I, I had an employee who had uh, every coffee truck in town stopped and he had four or five cups of coffee a day. I think he was addicted. I think I have a habit of coffee. I drink one in the morning, every day. I also drink a beer in the evening. I think I have a habit. I am not an alcoholic. Alcoholics are addicted. From everything I read, you can become a marijuana habit but you're not addicted. The question is, what do you mean? If I smoke a joint a week, am I addicted? And is that what we've decided the addiction to marijuana is? The other thing is, did I start on marijuana before I went to heroin and cocaine? No, I started on beer. And then I went to marijuana and the guy who sold it to me said, don't believe all those things they told you about marijuana. And I found out it wasn't addictive, and I didn't get high like I got drunk. And he said, Tim, and he said this because he makes more money selling heroin and cocaine. They lied to you about heroin and cocaine. And I found out they had lied to me about marijuana, so I believed. They lied to me about heroin and cocaine, and I became addicted to those. And that's why that was his first illegal choice for you, and he's in an illegal business. He's not going to start you on beer. He's going to start you on the simplest drug, and the cheapest to him, and the cheapest to you. And then you go to uh, driving. They've done work in research in England and they have found marijuana smokers, if they can avoid driving when they are smoking, they avoid driving. That's not what I experience with drugs. Because we know we're supermen and we can drive drunk or sober. They also found that if they were forced to drive, in other words, I got to meet an appointment and I've had a few, I've had a joint, one, they found they drove on average five to 10 miles an hour slower. That's not what you find with drugs. Now, to go back to addiction, the biggest killers of America and most addictive drug is tobacco. Do we complain? Do we make it outlaw? Do we say, you smoked in a house with your four-year-old grandson? You should be in prison. But a man who does a joint a week and smokes in the same house as his <coughs> grandson, we want to put in prison. You know, if consistency ought to be part of democracy. If we're going to outlaw something, it should be tobacco. 
we tried it with alcohol, and we certainly did a lot for the mafia. We gave them a business to be in that was quite popular, and they did very well. And booze did not disappear. But some things that we thought were booze did appear. Because a bootlegger doesn't care if you live. So he sold you a little gasoline with sugar in it and told you it was rum or something else. So I would like to stop filling our prisons with our children and grandchildren. And I would ask you, if you know somebody in the teens or 20s, ask them if they could get you a little marijuana and don't have to smoke it, you can eat it. But just try it. And when you don't get drunk, you'll stop using the words that don't apply. And there's only so many receptors in the human brain to marijuana, THC, so you can't go beyond. Like, you, can you drink yourself to stupor? You can drink yourself dead. Alcohol will stop your heart and your brain working. Marijuana can get you so high, and that's as high as you're going to get on marijuana unless you go to something stronger. I, I could go on and on and on, but there are other people who want to talk, and I've been doing this long enough to know that I think I've made most of my point. <coughs> questions? Thank you very much for your testimony, Representative. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. The chair will call Chief Goldstein, please. Good morning, Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. The gentleman can ask you a couple of great deal of what I had to say, so I will be very brief in my remarks. My name is David Goldstein, for the record. I'm the Chief of Police in the City of Franklin, and I represent the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police, and we are in opposition to this bill. And we certainly appreciate the fact that the prime sponsor has tried to make some changes to the bill. However, there's still a number of questions remaining as to whether or not this bill is in any way, shape, or form a good bill. We feel that there's some technical problems with the wording. For instance, <clears throat> it mentions forfeiture of marijuana only if the person is convicted. So what happens to the marijuana if the individual is not convicted? Right now, marijuana is contraband, which by definition means it's illegal and we take it. There is no process in this bill, or under any existing law right now, for anyone under 18 how we might charge them with a violation in court. Chins does not apply to violations. So in effect, this has made uh, juvenile possession of marijuana de facto legal. <clears throat> Another scenario might be found when an individual is caught violating their parole or probation and they have possession of marijuana. What do we do with that individual? It is now merely a violation. It is a non-criminal offense. Is that person now in violation of their parole or probation? I have a number of studies here, and I'm going to pass out some material, my, <clears throat> my written remarks, as well as some reference uh, material. Recently, a study from King's College in London showed that marijuana with high levels of THC, which we have today, was linked to 24% of new cases of psychosis. In January, the Yale Medical School released a study showing increased impulsivity and hostility in young adults using marijuana. Colorado has produced a report that indicates that <clears throat> the use of marijuana in adolescents decreases um, IQ scores and increases the use of other drugs, to answer your question, Senator Cattell. The section on records keeping is very troublesome to us. What kind of records are we supposed to keep if we can't give those records out? How do we know that they are graduated penalties. If Tilton PD arrests someone or gives someone a hand summons for marijuana and they're not allowed to give that information out, how do I know that if Franklin PD but, uh, gives someone a violation of marijuana, is it second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth offense, or whatever? So we don't know about that. We can't track the cases through the court system in order to determine uh, whether there's any court ordered compliance issues. At best, this will be costly. We have to ask what's in the best interest of the state of New Hampshire because multiple st studies show very long-term problems with marijuana. <coughs> the increased use of marijuana will lead to decreased productivity, lower future income potential, diminished decision-making ability, increased incidence of mental health problems, and incident of risk of accidents in the home, at work, and in vehicles. 
minimizing the fine and the effects and the severity of this offense sends the very wrong message to our children and our young adults. And this is where we should be concentrating our efforts is in primary prevention. Never even trying to substance should be our goal. The legislation, if it passes, will prohibit the release of records to DOT, regulated businesses such as buses and airlines. It will prohibit the access of records uh, of violations by federal agencies, including the military, and other municipalities and states. So if an individual is uh, wanted on a warrant, we won't know. There seem to be some additional inconsistencies. I'll mention a couple and then I'll uh, answer any questions you might have. If we were to give a hand summons for marijuana, that is a violation. And as was already mentioned, the individual who gets that summons is allowed to challenge that in court. All right, is the state willing to allow my police officers to determine whether or not one is marijuana and two what its weight is? Or do I have to send that to the lab, the forensic lab, as we always have, and wait eight or 12 months to get a response for something minimal? So are we going to change the law in uh, the laws of evidence in that regard? We still have to meet the elements of the offense, no matter what that offense is. As law enforcement, we're, being, uh, we're asking law enforcement to be involved in this, uh, but we're not giving us the opportunity to do so in, in the best manner possible. The representative mentioned financial aid. Ever been convic convicted of possession, et cetera, was the question that he brought up. So it's okay to say no, it's okay to lie. Uh, and under uh, paragraph five, section B, there is no such thing as internal possession in the state of New Hampshire, other than, other than minors in possession of alcohol. So if you look at hair, cuticles, blood, semen, anything of that nature, it means nothing. We do not have an internal possession statute in New Hampshire. Also to answer Senator Cataldo's question, the National Institute of Drug Abuse says marijuana is addictive. That is part of the National Institutes of Health. I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator? Just one. We passed a law that we're going to have this medical marijuana facility set up in New Hampshire. Do we really need it if we pass this bill? The medical marijuana? That's a good question, Senator. Uh, my gut reaction would probably be no. Seeing that there are no further questions, thank you very much. Chair, call Devin Chafee. Devin Chafee, okay. Um, the chair, the chair called James Vanna. My name is James Varro. I'm a senior assistant attorney general at the New Hampshire Department of, uh, Department of Justice, currently assigned to the um, Drug Prosecution Unit. I also, I'll be very brief uh, in my uh, testimony here today. I want to just really talk about the argument that has been presented from the beginning. It's become a sliding scale argument, meaning that if one is good, the other isn't good, or one is bad, the other is, is no longer bad, meaning that well, tobacco is bad, and meaning alcohol is bad, then what are we doing about those? That, that really has changed the argument how it really should be. Should we have another drug? And in many ways, this is really a de facto legalization bill. And should we have another drug that the youth have an opportunity to use? And it was a question earlier by Senator Cataldo of will it become a gateway drug? Granted, this is only anecdotal and only from my approximately 10 years as a prosecutor. You do see people where they start with marijuana and then it goes further. Does it happen to all of them? Of course not. There are no finites in this world, you know, other than, there really are no finites, other than you're born and you die. Outside of that, there are no other finite real examples in life. So to say that, that it automatically or not automatically really is something that isn't true. Another real angle with this too is we are the 49th state in terms of access to treatment. Will people, because it will be seen as a traffic ticket, because in many ways it is, as a violation level offense used, will they have access to treatment? No, with the 49th state behind Texas. And that's certainly not something to be proud of, but certainly where we are now. And I want to just, um, and, and very briefly, discuss the bill. And I want to close on, there was a discussion of Colorado. 
on paragraph, and, and I, I should say, part of my, of course, part of my job is prosecution. I, I sort of, in many ways, live with 318B26. I sadly sometimes wake up in the middle of the night. It was a charge, right? Um, when you look at um, page number five of the, of the amended uh, bill, and um, sentence number 11, it discusses sale of marijuana of more than one half ounce, including um, any adulterants or dilutants, or hashish in more than five grams, including any adulterants or dilutants. If you look at that, how it's currently constituted, what if you were to sell under one half ounce of marijuana? What is the penalty for that? No one has addressed this because um, if they were to, they would see there's absolutely no penalty. So you can sell marijuana in less than one half an ounce and there is no felony penalty for it. You may be able to charge them with possession, uh, but we have learned if this bill were to go forward, it is a violation level offense. So if you were to sell marijuana under one half ounce, it is a violation level offense. And that's certainly, and that's one of, and I don't want to address all the other concerns certainly addressed by Lieutenant Encarnacio as well as uh, Chief Goldstein. The one thing I do want to close with and certainly answer any questions is the Colorado Attorney General in 2015, she, um, to a group of other states' attorneys generals, said this in terms of marijuana legalization. Quote, unquote, it's not worth it. And she also indicated and rebuked the legalization advocate's longstanding argument that regulating sales will eliminate the black market for marijuana and associated criminal activity. Quote, don't buy that argument. The criminals are still selling on the black market. We have plenty of cartel activity in Colorado and plenty of illegal activity that have not decreased at all, unquote. Is that where our state's moving forward to? It's certainly not something that me as a citizen of the state would want to see. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the committee? Thank, you. Thank you. The chair will call Seamus Casey. Good morning, almost afternoon at this point. Well, I'm Sheriff Casey from Barrington, and I am here to speak in the office. I've been here before, I recognize most of you. Driving point, uh, driving home the point that the punishment should fit the crime. That is just the biggest problem with the current statutes. We all agree that children should not be using a substance. Do we think the state should be taking the place of parents? No, of course not, but that seems to be a theme that I keep hearing about. Protect the children, what about the children? But <coughs> the biggest issue, biggest thing I want to raise here is if New Hampshire had ballot access referendum questions, we wouldn't be here today and every other year when this comes forward. So those of us who speak, or want to speak about this or think strongly enough about it, taking time off of work like myself today, coming here to ask you, because this is the only avenue to change this process. As the statistics that stated, I think it's like 70, 71% support this. So we have to come to you and ask for that. I hear information, um, some of it I, I suspect is biased, perhaps from both sides. There seems to be no conclusive evidence from either side. So anyone stating this is a gateway drug, no this isn't. There is no conclusive evidence stating that. But all we do have to say is we here in this state want this to move forward. We have no other avenue to make that happen than to come and basically beg you to allow that to happen. And I, I wish that you would please factor that in. Keep in mind that the majority of the vast majority of the people of this state want to see this move forward. We don't want to be the embarrassment in New England that we are the only state that has not moved forward with this. We are surrounded by every other state that has. Our state motto, live <coughs> free or die. Okay? What happened to that? What happened to that? There's, there's, something is missing. Something is wrong. But the fact that New Hampshire has not moved forward away from this draconian treatment of the possession of a natural occurring substance and all of our surrounding states have. And I have a problem with that. That's why I chose to take a day off of work to come here and try to raise that again. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning, Mr. Casey. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Patalba. Just one. Sir. 
You can live free or die all you want in this state. That's the first, first question. One of the things that I have to question for is that a couple of years ago, we legalized marijuana for medicinal purposes. What happens now if we legalize this <coughs> half an ounce or whatever? We get rid of those places, we don't need them anymore? Well, I am certainly not a um, medical expert, I'm an engineer. So, uh, but I will, I will certainly address that from my own personal perspective. I think it's what you're looking for. And what I would state is, those who have a prescription for marijuana, they don't have to worry about these legal penalties. Though I must also correct that you just stated legalize. This bill, HB 618, does not attempt to legalize. It's strictly to reduce the penalties. So we must make that distinction. We're not here legalizing or asking it for it to be, to be legalized. Other people have tried that. Uh, that didn't even get out of the house. Here, this bill consistently makes it out of the house with what? Uh, 80% majority this time around, that there is very reflective of the people of New Hampshire and the will of the people to change this. So I don't think asking if this passes, I don't think that you can say that it would eliminate the medical marijuana. That there is a professional medical opinion of a doctor stating that yes, I truly believe that this natural substance proven to be far less harmful than pharmaceuticals will benefit this person. So I do not think that if this becomes decriminalized, that that would have any bearing at all on the medical opinion of the medical professionals. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thank you very much. The chair will call Jonathan Cohen. The, the current state of the law in New Hampshire is simply unjust when it comes to possession of small amounts of marijuana. And this gives me grave concern uh, as a lawyer, as an officer of the court. When people think the law is unjust and arbitrary, they stop following the law. And that is the reality, and that is why this law is before you. Um, I do want to bring the focus in for a moment uh, to a scene that plays out in my office frequently. And this is when I'll meet with a young person and their parents, maybe they're 19, maybe they're 20, they have no record, they have no uh, history of getting into any trouble. They're in school, either in high school or college. And they may have a job, they may live at home, they may live on campus, and they're scared to death. And their parents are scared to death because they are accused of possession of small amounts of marijuana. And I then have to be the messenger. I have to be the bearer of bad news. I have to talk to them about the fact that marijuana can be charged as a class A or class B misdemeanor that they could get up to a year in jail and a $2,000 fine, and that they could be labeled a criminal. And oftentimes, this is the most concerning thing, is that being labeled as a criminal. If they're receiving federal financial aid, that may be in jeopardy. They may be in jeopardy of losing their job because the newspapers will print that they have been charged with a crime, that they could be a criminal. And I see the fear, not just in the young person in my office, in, in their face, in their parents' face as well. 
And I simply do not see this when I have the exact same scenario and they're accused of possessing alcohol illegally. I just don't see this. And the reality is, I handle a lot of criminal cases. I have handled a lot of criminal cases. Uh, back when I was a public defender um, in the Manchester area, I would have an active caseload, sometimes as high as 100 cases at one time. And what I have seen is that alcohol is responsible for so many serious, of the serious cases that I would handle. Felony level assaults, assaults with weapons, assaults that cause serious bodily injury. DWI cases that result in horrendous accidents, death, maiming. Sexual assaults. When I read these police reports, it is almost always alcohol that is involved in these offenses. Sometimes marijuana as well, sometimes not. Sometimes other drugs as well, sometimes not. But alcohol is the culprit almost every time. But they're treated differently. Alcohol is not under the criminal code. Alcohol is a civil penalty. You are looking at a violation if you're accused of possessing alcohol. You're looking at, at most, a fine. And this is unjust, and this is arbitrary when you look at the harms of the substances. And this is what I see. I know that, um, Senator Cataldo, you have asked questions about um, what happens with medical marijuana if we pass this. This is a decriminalization bill. This is not a bill to legalize. There have been bills to legalize, uh, but this is different than that. Just like it would be illegal for someone under 21 to possess alcohol, this would make it uh, the same or similar for marijuana. So it doesn't solve the problem of someone who has a medical need for a prescription for marijuana. But what I would point out, and what is implicit in this, is that there are proven medical benefits to marijuana that do not exist for alcohol or cigarettes, which we already allow. This brings this into line with those substances. I would also uh, like to point out that um, Chief uh, Goldstein, I believe, testified that, well, so this is basically legalizing if you're a juvenile. We wouldn't be able to charge them with delinquency petitions. And I've done a tremendous amount of juvenile work, and what I will tell you is, it is true that the delinquency statute defines a, delinquent, a delinquent act as a misdemeanor or greater as a crime. But there is also a Chins petition, and that is also in juvenile court. And that would certainly qualify, just like if a juvenile was abusing alcohol or cigarettes, they would have a Chins petition, because those aren't crimes. This would bring that into line with the way that juveniles are treated. You would bring a chins petition. And frankly, the remedies are the same available under either statute. You can still wind up in placement. I've had kids placed under both. You can still wind up ordered into treatment. I've had kids ordered into treatment under both. And you can have kids um, the, the exact same. Uh, it's just an issue of which statute you're proceeding to. <coughs> And like I said, alcohol, cigarettes, when I've had kids that abuse those, that don't stop abusing those, that's what's brought as a chins petition. Because you can't bring a delinquency petition based on a minor who abuses alcohol either. Um, I also want to just address uh, something that I'm hearing from law enforcement, which is that people don't go to jail for possession of marijuana. I have had people go to jail for possession of marijuana. Not distribution, possession. In fact, I practiced in a court in the state where the unofficial official policy in that court was that any second offense, regardless of the quantity, one joint, you must get 30 days in jail. And they would not take negotiated dispositions that did not involve that. So that is absolutely not true to say that people don't go to jail for possessions of small amount of marijuana. 
Also, you should be aware that because a prosecutor or a police department can elect to bring it as a class B misdemeanor, bring it as a violation, or bring it as a class A misdemeanor, and technically it could be brought as a felony under the state of the laws that exists right now, there is tremendous discretion. And not every police department and not every prosecutor handles every case the same way. And this again leads to arbitrary results and different results depending on where you happen to be arrested <coughs> within this state. <coughs> I also want to address the issue of the gateway drug, this specter that law enforcement, which I would point out, has a financial incentive for maintaining the current state of the law. Forfeitures, governmental grants, state grants, towards things like the Drug Task Force, there is money involved in keeping marijuana illegal. And what I can tell you is that I have had clients who have been addicted to heroin, a number of them. I have had clients who have talked to me about their history, and frankly, all due respect to law enforcement, I believe that my clients are more truthful with me than they are when they sit down with them. And what I have heard many, many times is that my clients that are addicted to heroin oftentimes start off with prescription painkillers. That is what leads them down the road to heroin. They fall off a roof, they hurt their back, they hurt their knee, they are prescribed prescription pain medication, and eventually that prescription runs out, and they don't have the money to continue to take those, and heroin is cheaper. And that's what leads to it. If we want to try to say what leads to it in terms of, well, we can look at what they've abused in the past, alcohol is almost always there before anything. The last thing that I want to make, I want to make two more points. One of them is this. We have heard from law enforcement about the high rate of use of marijuana in this state. What you don't hear from law enforcement is that the current state of the law is effective. What exists and what has continued to exist and what they are here asking you to perpetuate is not working. If everyone is using, it's simply not effective. What are we here defending? What prophylactic effect does the current 318B have? This is an important question to consider. And lastly, I will just say that it is my experience that when I have college-age students, they often go to school outside the state of New Hampshire. They grow up here, they go to school in Mass, they go to school in Maine, they go to school in Vermont, they go to school in Rhode Island. States that have already passed decriminalization bills. And when they come back here, they are confused. Many of them have not been in trouble and they assume that what exists in their state is the same here. And when they see the draconian sentences that they face here compared to other places where they are living, where they're going to school, where their friends are, it doesn't make sense to them. They find it unjust because it's not consistent. We cannot afford to continue to be out of step with the rest of New England. So I appreciate you listening to my testimony and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Senator Lasky has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. Um, so in your experience, you would consider alcohol a gateway drug? Absolutely, yes. Alcohol and cigarettes as well. Absolutely. Senator Davis. Okay. Under current law, is alcohol considered an illegal drug for someone under 18? It is not considered an illegal drug. It is not a controlled drug is the term of art under 318B. Alcohol is its own thing. It is regulated under a separate section of the RSAs. Um, and possession of alcohol is punishable by a fine, but you cannot go to jail for being a minor in possession of alcohol the way you can for a minor in possession of marijuana. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. The chair will call Dr. Becky Ewing.
For the record, my name is Dr. Becky Ewing. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, and I'll try to be very brief. First of all, I'm very grateful for your service. I can imagine making these decisions. Um, second, um, I'm here to talk about the prevalence of uh, marijuana use in pregnancy, the impact on the developing fetus, and the impact on young children in the home where marijuana is used. I am concerned about any normalization of the use of marijuana, um, and that's why I'm concerned about this bill. I don't um, pretend to have the answers about how to help people make good decisions, but I do know that if you make um, an act normal, um, that if you are in a state of need, like really <coughs> nauseated from being pregnant, um, you may choose to use that substance. THC is uh, stored in fat. Babies' brains are made of fat, and so the THC tends to be stored in the developing fetus's brain. Uh, it has impacts um, through youth. Uh, I did another PubMed search yesterday. This is a very difficult population to study scientifically because there are very few women who are not incarcerated who are studied, and most of the women who are incarcerated have been have uh, exposed their fetuses to many drugs. Um, but in early controlled research, they do find that babies who are exposed to THC on a regular basis during pregnancy have decreased eye tracking movements for their parents um, and probably have some significant long-term sequelae from exposure. Uh, so my, my point is very brief that I think Anything that makes marijuana more available to young women <coughs> makes puts a baby at risk. And I think those are long-term consequences that if we as a population decide to normalize marijuana use, then just like we've legalized and profited from alcohol, we need to have the moral backbone to stand up and take responsibility for those unintended consequences. It's expensive. So we need to fund the fund, and we need to, we need to step to the plate if we're going to think that adults can handle this. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Doctor. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Fitzgerald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one question, Doctor. Have you seen any studies where they've used animals uh, smoking marijuana and what the effects of those animals were? Um, the, the studies in rats, um, primarily out of SUNY Upstate Steve Youngenkow's research, um, show that if an animal is exposed in utero, then um, if they are exposed again as an adolescent animal, then they are more apt to be, have an addictive disorder with that substance. We like the things our mothers like, we eat the foods our mothers eat, but he's taken that on to also work with THC and with alcohol. Um, and just to follow up, because I remember that study that was up there at the time when you were testing out these animals. Thank you very much. Okay. So your last question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. Um, <coughs> clearly, I understand why you know, you, there are not definitive studies just uh, about marijuana and pregnancy, but obviously there's alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome and uh, certainly uh, poor results from women who smoke, undersized babies, et cetera. Um, would this just be, in your mind, one additional thing on, on the fetus, or, or should, you know, I mean, obviously, what can we do about those other things as well? Um, I, I, right, I exactly. Don't to, I, I know, I, I understand, and, and as an obstetrician, you help women, you help with smoking cessation programs, you, um, you 
get them to bring their packs of cigarettes in, you number cigarettes, you talk about alcohol. There's a whole group of women who just plain didn't understand. I think right now we live in a culture with so much information that people put together what's okay to do in the kind of patchwork fashion. And when we legalize and normalize things, uh, patients make decisions about uh, how to eat and how to behave is <coughs> a um, kind of mishmash of information. So yes, it is one more um, thing that babies, or one more uh, toxin that babies experience, and uh, it, it, it's challenging. This is, it's <laughs> not a pure science. Uh, people are incredibly resilient, and babies are very resilient, and at the same time, there's a point past which you can injure an infant to the extent that they, they either don't survive or they survive in a very impaired manner. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Um, the chair will <coughs> be listener. My name is Jane Listener. I am an occupational therapist and also a former professor of occupational therapy from the University of New Hampshire um, and have been a marijuana user for over 30 years. A little bit of history to uh, my, the gist of my story, but um, in March of 2011, I was hired by the federal government as an occupational therapist at the state agency. Um, I was hired and on the first day of work, I had asked a question. The question was, if I had a medicinal prescription, meaning I would move over to Maine and commute, if I had a prescription, would I lose my job? And it came down to me, uh, me um, admitting I used marijuana, which means I was punished via the policies and procedures of the person um, admitting marijuana use. So I was sent to um, the counseling services, even though I had my own counselor and I was put on a year drug test probation, meaning at any point in time I could be drug tested. Um, with, with six months after my date of start, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I went through six months of, of chemotherapy and was not able to use marijuana to ease my 36 symptoms and side effects because of my job and the risk of potentially losing my job. When my chemotherapy ended, that probationary ended period ended, I resumed using. It helped me through the recovery of those 26 um, side effects. In November of 2000, to now 2012, I was in Portsmouth Hospital for back surgery. Um, I had had chronic pain, and which is one of the reasons I had used marijuana previously, chronic back pain as well as insomnia, sleep issues, and PTSD and anxiety. So after my probation period, I went back to using to help uh, with, with my post-chemo recovery and to deal with my chronic pain issues and anxiety and sleep. Um, while I was a patient in the hospital, a friend brought in the wrong piece of luggage. I was scheduled to be away for 14 weeks with this friend, so I had my medications as well as my vaporizer and other things in a particular bag. He brought the bag into the hospital by mistake because of it was smelled. Um, I was confronted by the hospital staff and asked if um, I had any marijuana and if I turned it over, they would not contact the police. I did that. I offered them my vaporizer. They did not want it. Um, they left and said that they were going to tell my doctor. They came back about 10 minutes later and said, we want to go through your bags again. And this time they ripped my bags out and as they were going through my bags, they came across my med case. I take 10 prescribed medications, four of which are controlled substances. I take them responsibly, they're prescribed to me um, and for the specific need. And uh, the hospital actually had a list of this because I had taken two of the meds in order for me to have my surgery that day. When they saw my medications, they confiscated them from me and then proceeded to tell me they were going to call the police. It was assumed I was a drug dealer because of the volume of drugs that I had with me, which again were my prescription drugs. The police came, they interviewed me, 
They asked me if I knew why they were there, and I said because of my medications. Um, this was in November. He proceeded to call me over the next several months as we went into 2013. And in January of 2013, he told me they were attempting to pursue federal charges against me for my controlled substances <coughs> that were not in their prescription bottles of Ramadi. So during this time, I was able to prove that the, the medications were mine. They were prescribed for me rightfully by my doctors. So they decided not to pursue that charge, but they were going to charge me with possession of marijuana. It was a Class B misdemeanor. This was now in March. In April of 2013, my job found out about the arrest. It was during that time that I was uh, formally investigated and fired because one, it was considered my second offense. Secondly, because I panicked and I stated I had eaten a cookie during my recovery process and um, I was fired. Um, my, I lost an $80,000 job here. I was one year status post cancer treatment, meaning I lost my medical benefits. Um, the trial was postponed until April of last year, 16 months. It was postponed on three different occasions, meaning that we met with the, the, the police officers, lawyers, investigators to have it dismissed and rescheduled. It was finally rescheduled for April of last year. I was unemployed from June of 2011 to till March of last year. I had no money. I had no money to even drive to my, put gas in my car to drive to my lawyer. And I was suicidal in February. And I came very close to ending my life because of the level of despair I was in. Knowing that I may never ever be able to work again in my chosen profession. Um, in April of last year, I was found guilty and I was charged a fee. I currently, um, because of that, I cannot pass a background check. In addition, if a person Googles me on page three, you can see a police write-up that is er very erroneous and incorrect. Um, at this point in time, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. Um, I kind of live month to month praying to God that uh, I'm able to pursue private clients or I do per deal with a particular agency. Um, it just is a travesty that, that this happened. Uh, for 20 years, I've been working as an occupational therapist. And just to give you an example, the board of licensure felt that the situation was so absurd, they did not pursue disciplinary actions against me. Um, I currently, <clears throat> um, I currently do use marijuana. It helps with the side effects that I suffer from, from chemotherapy, including chronic pain, neuropathy, and um, severe insomnia <laughs> with PTSD and I have to take two controlled substances to go to sleep. I would very gladly just use marijuana. I would use that instead of pain medication, instead of sleep medication, instead of my anxiety medication. I have abstained for long periods of time from marijuana use, proving that I do not have a physical or a psychological addiction. You're concerned about addictions? Well, how many people have one of these? How many people have been checking it? That's an addiction. So as far as spans of addictions go, um, I don't want to break the law. I want to be legal. My psychiatrist and my primary care doctor would prescribe marijuana for me, but my cancer is in remission, and I do not currently meet the qualifications. So I either have to consider moving to another state or doing something that is considered illegal when I already now have a record. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. The chair will call R. Dennis Corrigan. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Dennis Corrigan and I'm in favor of the bill. I'm um, a member of the Board of Directors of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, but I'm here supporting the bill as a private citizen. I first smoked marijuana 50 years ago. I've lived under the threat of criminal charges, um, fearing a knock at the door for all that time. I'm a retired actuary, and friends I've smoked marijuana with include other actuaries, members of at least one of each of the following professions, lawyers, accountants, 
policemen, underwriters, business owners, authors, politicians, economists, engineers, poets, photographers, musicians, artists, stockbrokers, mortgage brokers, investment brokers, nurses, school teachers, professors, IT professionals, athletes, tax preparers, journalists, realtors, chefs, investment managers, barbers, bankers, and bakers. The vast, the vast numbers of, major, of marijuana users speak to the need for the repeal of prohibition. Survey numbers suggest tens of millions of Americans and at least 100,000 New Hampshire residents use marijuana. These survey numbers significantly underreport usage since to answer surveys in the affirmative exposes the respondent to perceived risks. Senators, I expect that your friends and members of your families include marijuana users, husbands and wives, children and grandchildren. If you decline this opportunity to repeal this permit, pernicious prohibition, you're exposing them to arrest and jail penalties. I appeal to you, permit me to live for the first time in my adult lifetime, no longer as a criminal. Remove this burden too, from all the professionals that I've mentioned who are subject to incarceration. Repeal prohibition to help those friends of yours and those in your own families who are subject to this profoundly bad law. Finally, in my experience, it's very rare to find marijuana users who use any other illegal substances. Similarly, sellers of marijuana, in my experience, do not promote sales of other drugs. Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. The chair will call um, Susan McKean. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and thank you very much for giving me time to speak. My name is Susan McKeown, and I'm here as a Family Support Coordinator for the Children's Behavioral Health Collaborative. And in that role, I oversee the establishment of parent support groups in the state for parents whose children, teens, and young adults have substance issues. Uh, I'm here to <coughs> ask you to oppose House Bill 618. And you know, I was hoping I could speak earlier today, um, but I have to say it's been very interesting to sit here and to listen to the different testimonies, all of which have points that have to be considered. Um, however, I, as I said, do hope to support the um, the opposition to uh, House Bill 618. I'm concerned about the passage of this bill due to public health and public safety considerations and the ramifications that it has on our citizens in the New Hampshire. As a parent of four adult children, 40 years as a nurse practitioner, working with two generations of families, as a certified prevention specialist who works advocating and educating on substance abuse issues and mental health issues, um, all these roles converge to make me very passionate about the ramifications this has on our families. For the last 11 and a half years, I have facilitated the support group in Manchester, which deals with parents whose children are having addiction issues and substance misuse issues. When we started that group 11 and a half years ago, um, it was one of parents whose children were smoking pot, not keeping curfews, skipping school, and generally being disruptive at home. As I looked over the group last week of 20 parents, two of them were parents of teens who were smoking pot, one was using ecstasy, the other 18 were using heroin. None of those kids started with heroin. There have been 8,000 parent visits in our group alone, and we now have 10 groups around the state um, over these last several years, and that represents about 1,000 children. With the exception of only two parents, all those kids, <clears throat> two parents had kids that had used opiates for medically prescribed reasons. All the others report that their children started with marijuana. I'm very well aware that not every person who smokes marijuana goes on to use heroin. And to kind of address your concerns, Senator Montalto, that you've brought up, the research is really very clear on that. 
one out of six teens, which is 16%, or one out of 11 adults, which is 9%, do go on to progressive use, and that's because of their genetic predisposition, just as if they had asthma, uh, diabetes, or heart disease. It's part of their family history. We know from our experience with alcohol and cigarettes, when availability increases, access increases to those who did not intend. When the prescription of harm decreases, the usage increases. And that is a big concern about this bill and the slippery slope that it's looking at. And the difference why between teens and adults is because of the teenage brain is not fully developed. And we know with any organ, when it is in a period of rapid growth, it is more susceptible to adverse effects. And that's the concern. The bill refers to a half ounce of marijuana, which is the equivalent of 30 joints. I think that's been said today and challenged, but it has been part of the uh, literature. Um, if that's for personal use, that's very high usage. And if it's not for personal use, I think we have to consider distribution. We've spent decades and millions of dollars, likely billions, educating the public about smoking to the point now where it would be the very rare person that would not agree that smoking is not a healthy thing to do. Yet we know how addictive it is and how very difficult it is to give up. Now we have a substance being presented to us that makes it more available and one of it is primarily smoked. We won't get into edibles today. We know marijuana alters the brain, which is the very reason why it's sought, why it's used. We know that it impairs driving, and we know that it is as addictive as cigarettes. In addition to these concerns, one effect that regular marijuana users will attest to is it is the ultimate motivation killer. I think that deserves a lot of attention because that's an effect that has a significant meaning for our state's productivity and will eventually affect the revenue. There's no clear path in this bill for assessing those individuals who are at risk for increased usage so that intervention and treatment can be provided. Kids are actually treated more harshly in this bill and there are no programs, as uh, uh, Mr. Harding mentioned, for kids in the community to get the education that this bill talks about. Let's ensure kids have an exit ramp so that they can get early intervention, be identified, and also so that adults can be picked up by early screening and a referral for treatment. Any fines collected should go right into a fund for intervention, prevention, treatment, and recovery services. There should be a direction for those fines. To say that a lot of people smoke marijuana ignores the fact that a lot of people do not smoke marijuana because there are loud cries to lessen the penalties without a well thought understanding of how this would impact our citizens is listening to the wrong outcry and not doing justice to the public health and safety of our citizens. So I really ask that you close this bill. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. The chair will call John Dixon. John Dixon. Okay, um, the chair will call Willie Brown. Thank you for hearing me today. I'll be very quick. A lot of people here. A couple of things that I want to bring up, very important. What I have with me here is numerous groups from the Schaefer Commission to the Global Commission to the London School of Economics to the National Academy of Sciences and 18 member committee that study drug policy all unanimously, all unanimously devote, um, voted to decriminalize cannabis. When you look at the Schaefer Commission, composed of an 18-member panel, I believe, with 76 
people that staff members that helped to do the research were 37,000 pages of interviews and information on cannabis, a four volume appendix uh, from the Shaper Commission alone, the most up to date, most comprehensive study on cannabis to date, the Shaper Committee back in the 70s told Nixon that we need to decriminalize for mathematic scientific reasons for the mere fact that we spent so much money trying to do something that we that has been a mistake right from the beginning. We've been trying to incarcerate, incarcerate our way out of problems with drugs and that is the last policy that we needed to follow in order to have better results than we've had lately. The bottom line is this, I have 635 people all here that have all done studies on cannabis, all suggest decriminalization. Now when you have institutions from around the world, the people on the Global uh, Commission were from Pakistan, Mexico, Colombia, Greece, Spain, uh, uh, United Nations, Ghana, Germany, Peru, France, all around the world took a really good look at cannabis. And the reality is, is we cause so many problems for our society by <coughs> making marijuana illegal. By not decriminalizing, we are, we are sending the wrong message to youth. We're telling youth that we don't really understand drugs. And uh, the bottom line is, is uh, even Jimmy Carter himself said back in 78 in, in, to New York Magazine, he said uh, to Time Magazine, that it makes no sense to have the laws for drugs be worse damage for people than the drugs themselves actually cause. And the bottom line is, is we would help our citizens, we'd be better off to treat them with love and humanity and try to help them when they have substance problems rather than to incarcerate and punish our way out of the problem. Now, if you read the Global Commission's report, and you read the Schaefer report, and you read all these reports of 635 professionals in law, medicine, uh, socialism, presidents from different countries all around the world, 635 people all, all congruently and concur that we need to decriminalize, you have to ask yourself, if you have all these institutions with all these people from all around the world saying that that's what we need to do, you have to ask, then ask yourself, well, where is the information that comes to us that is, is equal and is great and large as all of these people that have looked at it that tell us the opposite? And I, and I don't see it. I don't see 635 people that come out with reports for volume in appendixes with information on cannabis to tell us why we should not have it be legal. Um, I, and I also hear people come up here and they make comments which bothers me because I've come to these hearings, I've heard people make comments, and then I've gone back and fact-checked myself. And you'll hear someone come up and say, he'll say, um, we found that uh, marijuana is linked to psychosis. Now, if you read, I, I went back and I've read reports like that, and if you read it, it says, suggest, implies, a possibility of a connection to. But in, in all worlds, in words technically, that's not what they say. They said there's a possibility, it suggests they might be some psychosis as a result of youth. Obviously, everything that we've been doing to decriminalize here, we've always kept in mind youth and keeping children away from it, and that's a smart idea. When the brain's developing, you don't want to be putting substances into the body that might alter the brain. But the bottom line is, the reality is, is decriminalizing should never happen. It all happened for political reasons back in the 30s and in the 70s, and the reality is, is that scientists have taken a look at this, Highly intelligent people have looked at this, and we've had a long time to look at it. We see the results, we see the math. Things don't get better when you arrest people for drugs. You take somebody and you arrest them with some marijuana and you bring them down to the police station, the next guy is gonna come up and sell the marijuana with a guy you just arrested with selling it. You're not gonna stop anything by arresting somebody, taking the guy from guy A and put it in B, is not gonna do anything as far as A, someone else is gonna fill slot A. So we know mathematically we are not doing any good by arresting people for marijuana. And the reality is, is you, you, look, you, you look at the reality of this. You have House A and House B. House A, they're all drinking. They can drink beer as much as they want. They can drink alcohol and fall down and you can't do anything to them. It's not illegal. And if somebody in that house wants to smoke a joint and have some Oreo cookies and milk and watch a movie, you can go and arrest that person because marijuana is illegal even though alcohol, we know scientifically, is much worse for your body, much, much worse on multiple levels. Uh, psoriasis, uh, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, 
um, all kinds of different problems as a result of not being able to work, not being able to function, not being able to drive safely. A million, a multitude of things from alcohol, but not from um, cannabis. Yet we will arrest somebody for using cannabis, and we won't do anybody, anything to anyone that, for using the alcohol. The reality is we're not in a perfect world. We do know alcohol is worse for people physically than cannabis, yet we'll arrest somebody for using cannabis and do nothing for them for using alcohol. So we need to be fair. We need to tell the people, that, that we need to show the people of the state of New Hampshire we recognize the difference between cannabis and heroin and crack. We recognize it, the individuals themselves will determine what a substance is or isn't by the way they use it oftentimes. A substance alone usually is the substance itself. It's what someone does with a substance is what can make it bad or good. The bottom line is, is we need to take a real look at You've got to treat people decently and treat them with respect. Don't walk up to me and tell me that marijuana is worse than alcohol. Don't tell me alcohol is okay, but marijuana is bad. Don't tell me everybody that wants to drink alcohol can drink and that's fine, but if you want to use some cannabis, I'm going to arrest you because that's simply not fair. If you look at the reality of marijuana and cannabis, it, it, it makes absolutely mathematically, scientifically no sense to allow alcohol and then tell somebody they need to be incarcerated or punished for using marijuana. Sure, there's concerns about people getting marijuana and doing things with them, that, that people using it, you know, young kids using it. We, we, we have to be careful and watch that, and we are working on that. We're not improving it. We have to be able for kids to use cannabis at all. So you need to stay in line with 635 people. And these aren't uh, 635, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know, how, to, I, I don't know how, to, how I can put it. How do you take world leaders and professionals, you know, you have uh, uh, Paul Volcker, the former chairman of the United States Federal Reserve Economics. So he looked at, you know, all the economics of how the math of what happens when we have incarceration and all this. Kofi Annan, he looks at it from the United Nations and all, the, all around the globe, how it's all affected. And we have, we have all these experts in all these different fields to get the best, most comprehensive look. We would be fools if we said no to the discrimination uh, of, of, of marijuana. Because the bottom line is it tells people, geez, uh, they must be saying uh, alcohol is okay, but marijuana is bad. Mm -hmm. And then you start, when you start to look at it, you're going, what are they trying to say? What are they trying to tell you? And it, and it seems like it, really, it doesn't really look like anybody that's for uh, marijuana being against the law and not decriminalized, it doesn't, you really got to ask yourself, do they really have a good understanding of cannabis and what's going on with it today? That's, Thank that, you so much. At this point, you're, you've repeated yourself. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's just, it's, 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 I think it's, you've made and your point. one last thing too I'd like to say is, you know, when you have people like uh, Mr. Sifty coming down here, he makes money from taking people to court, to going to court with clients, and he's willing to come down here because it's just so wrong and say, look, I can make money from marijuana being illegal, but I know that that's not right. And I'm here to say, as much as I like making money, it's just not right. And when you have local people that make money from marijuana being illegal coming up to you and saying, you know, I know I make money from it, but I just want to say it's not right. You really need to be paying attention to that person. And when you're the last state in New England to decriminalize, that's another sign you need to say to yourself, am I missing something? Everybody around me is doing something. That's usually a good time to ask yourself, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's something I'm not paying attention to. But well, thank you very much for your testimony. And, and question no, I think we're all set. Thank oh, you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the chair will call Celeste Clark. At this point, we've had, as you can We've had quite a bit of testimony, and I'm just going to ask folks um, if you uh, we're interested in hearing new things. So if you have testimony, please do not read it, and please do not repeat the testimony of other people. Thank you. Good morning, senators. Thank you very much for having us this morning. My name is Celeste. <coughs> I'm here representing the Governor's Commission Prevention Task Force. Um, I'm a professional in the field of um, prevention, also. That's what I do. I would like to oppose this bill for multiple reasons. I'm not going to repeat many of them. And I don't envy you for the past few years again with all this testimony that you've heard. Um, piggybacking on the message that was just delivered, a clear message is not what our youth are getting. Um, I specifically work with youth <coughs> and parents in our community, 
and the messages that they can help them to understand what's wrong and what's not wrong. Um, we know, as it was stated already, peer pressure, social norms, and perception of harm and wrongness contribute to use, and um, use is very difficult for kids to say no to, so that's something that we advocate for. Working with the youth in our community, they are actively involved. Um, they are part of <coughs> trying to send prevention messages to their peers. Many of them have family members and friends who are using, and they're trying to help them to stop and to make healthy choices. And then working with parents, one of the few tools that parents have right now is that this is illegal, and that they can use that in their toolbox to say that's one of the reasons that they shouldn't use. Because of all the miscommunication and the not a clear message that they're receiving, parents can at least fall back on that. Um, it is a, the bill that you have in front of you. Um, while I'm opposing it, I would say one thing is uh, missing in our state. We um, don't fund prevention and treatment very well. It's very difficult, it's a very hard task doing prevention. If you look at the bill, and it, um, something that would be changed, we have a diversion program in our community, and we have referrals for alcohol and marijuana, and it's for 20 and younger. So if you look at page one, line 14, where it says 18 years of age and younger, I think that that should at least be 20. And if you're going to look at this as a possibility, I think it should be must have an educational component, but not may, which is in line 16. We know treatment is second to last in the state, in the United States, um, and that's something that would be needed if this bill is put forward. But again, I oppose this bill for the sake of public safety and our youth. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Lasky has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Are you speaking on behalf of the Governor's Task Force, or are you just speaking for yourself? I'm a member, and it's the Governor's Commission task, Prevention Task Force. And has the, this is their position? They've had a discussion, and the chair of the task force told me I could come today and, and say that we have this. Thank you. Senator Davis. I'm sorry? She was not able to come today. <coughs> the chair of the task Okay, but you, you have discussed it as a group and this is the position. Thank you. Senator Can Davis. you just repeat your references the two years near the end? You said line 16, but I don't know which page you were on. I'm sorry. Um, I believe it's page one. Page one, mm -hmm. line 14. It says 18 <coughs> years of age. Okay. If we're comparing this to alcohol, I think it should be 20. And then in line 17, it says the court may order. I think it should be must. And for that to happen, our state will obviously have to have programming in place. And until that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. The chair will call Lisa Muir. New Hampshire and I'm speaking as a private citizen. Um, I'm a 25 year resident in New Hampshire. I'm a former public high school teacher and I've worked in substance use prevention and systems change for 15 years. I have a little story about a person in my life but I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and I'll definitely skip through the things that have already been said. Um, we know marijuana is not mind-altering drug. It impairs driving and therefore impacts the safety of non-users. The prevalence of fatal crashes related to marijuana use has tripled over the last 10 years, and that was a study done in states, including New Hampshire, that have not decriminalized or legalized its use. Also, according to our own Department of Safety, between 2008 and 2012, 52% of all drug-related traffic fatalities involved marijuana. New Hampshire, as was said before, already has a marijuana problem. According to the most recent national survey on drug use and health, 28% of our young adults in our state, our, our young workforce, our creative thinkers, um, use marijuana regularly compared to 19% nationally. Um, with, just with that information and knowing what marijuana does to the brain, I would think that our state would be investing in public health campaigns about the negative and adverse effects of marijuana, mar marijuana use rather than lessening deterrence by decriminalizing possession. Um, I also have a couple of um, some research that counters some of the myths that are discussed in, in desiring to decriminalize marijuana. The first myth is that marijuana is filling our jails. In a national survey by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, data showed that only 0.7% of all state inmates were behind bars for marijuana possession only, 
with many of them pleading down for more serious crimes. Um, also in total, one-tenth of 1% <coughs> of all state prisoners were marijuana possession offenders with no prior sentences. Um, there, this research probably hasn't been done in New Hampshire, but I think if you interview a lot of attorneys, some actually spoke about this today, that um, very few are actually being incarcerated um, solely for possessing small amounts of marijuana. Um, the second myth is that marijuana is keeping our youth from accessing student loans. The HEA aid elimination penalty that was passed by Congress in 1998 um, was changed in 2006 to restrict the reach of the penalty so that only people convicted while enrolled in college and while receiving aid may have that aid restricted. And for the first offense of possession only, it's only a restriction of the aid for one year. Um, also, data from the U.S. Department of Education revealed that between 2000 and 2006, when the law was broader, only 189,000 students were preventing, pre prevented from accessing student aid due to a conviction for a drug offense, either possession or selling of any illicit drug, not just marijuana, and that re represented one quarter of one percent of those applying for aid. Um, another myth, people don't get addicted to marijuana and don't require treatment. Um, as Celeste said, the, the data does show that 9% of those who try marijuana, try marijuana, develop dependence. But that does, it is less than other drugs. That compares to 15% of people who try cocaine, 24% of those who try heroin. However, because um, so many more people use marijuana than other illicit drugs, cannabis dependence is twice as prevalent as dependence on any other illicit psychoactive drug. Also, the percentage of marijuana users who develop dependence jumps from 9% 9 of them to 25 to 50% if you only look at daily users. And that range between 25 to 50 is how many years they've been um, daily users. So it is a, um, a drug um, that people become addicted to. Um, just looking at our youth in New Hampshire who sought treatment in the state-funded treatment program in 2012, 80% of our youth um, indicated that marijuana was their primary drug um, for which they were seeking treatment. And I'll just close with a couple of comments based on what I heard um, this morning. Um, first, I hope New Hampshire is not a state that bases its decisions on what the states around us are doing, that, that we really base it on objective um, consideration of facts that, and, and the desire to protect the health, individual and population health and well-being of our residents. Um, I hope one attorney talked about a disparity in the application of the law that perhaps minorities and low-income people are being um, unfairly treated. I hope that's not a reason to you know, make things legal because we could do that for a lot of other things um, because they're treated unfairly probably in a lot of other court cases as well. Um, and in closing, I just hope that our state does not decriminalize possession of a minor alternate drive. I don't think we need it. I don't think our children need it. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. The chair will call um, Melissa Fernald. My name is Melissa Farnall, and I am a licensed clinical social worker and a master's licensed alcohol and drug counselor. I'm from Wolfboro, New Hampshire, and I um, evaluate and treat um, drug addictions, um, substance use disorders, actually. And as a someone who treats um, your citizens who have addiction issues or substance use issues. And as a concerned citizen of New Hampshire, and more importantly, a mother, I strongly oppose this bill. I oppose it on so many levels, but there, are, there isn't enough time for me to, to do that. I'm told I had two minutes, but I'm going to do my best here. Um, there are two areas that I want to focus on. Um, one is the definition of marijuana in this bill, and amongst some of the descriptions that people have been giving over the last two hearings that I've been to, and the other thing that I want to talk about is the progression of substance use and um, treatment. Um, so I've come to the last public hearing on this issue, and I've sat here for a few hours in this one and listened to lots of people talk about marijuana. And I feel as though people are talking about it from the 1970s or 80s because the THC levels in marijuana we are using to the, the kids or kids and adults are using today is not the same marijuana that it was back then. 
And I have some additional information um, in the sheets that you can look at. I'm not going to go over each thing. Um, but the THC levels have rapidly increased over the, even the last two years since um, the recreational sale and the um, legalization of marijuana in Colorado. It has gone from 13% two years ago and it's up over 20% now. This drug, it, marijuana is not the same drug that it used to be, okay? The medical community has not researched, has not been able to research the THC levels at a 20%. They're still researching over a 10% THC level. Um, so that's kind of one piece of the THC. Um, my clients are coming in with very different um, experiences with the marijuana they're smoking these days. Um, and they're doing lots of different things with the marijuana. Lacing aside, just the marijuana itself, they're making concentrates out of it. Um, they are um, you know, extracting um, hash oil themselves. And they are, um, there's something called keep. They grind the weed in the grinder. And at the bottom is the high potent substance called keep. All marijuana, not an attitude, it's all marijuana. THC levels are up to 90%. This is not your typical weed. And this is what they're doing on, on the streets now. And um, I heard lots of reference to, oh, it's, there is a joint. Oh, they smoke a half a joint. Oh, so if somebody smokes one joint a week, they have an addiction? First of all, they're not smoking joints anymore. They're smoking blunts, and blunts are much larger than the joints of the 70s and 80s, 90s. Um, it's like having 10 joints in one and mixing it with tobacco. <laughs> so the reality is, you, if you're looking at this issue, know what the current trends of marijuana are. Um, I'm going to share an experience that um, with you that I got permission to share um, that happened four weeks ago um, to a client of mine and um, who smoked marijuana, um, what he thought was just regular marijuana, and he used what we call what they call a water water falling. Um, it's a water bomb and he it was used, it would have keep in it. And the keep is the real potent stuff that I was just talking about. And the water column is a huge hit. Um, so he ended up taking a hit, had a reaction, um, collapsed, and um, the peer he was with didn't want to get in trouble. So he left him there. Um, he almost died. He had a core body temperature of 84 degrees. And later on that evening, I'm standing in the ICU um, as he's unconscious with the ICU hospitalist who is asking me, what do you think he took? What do you think he took? His, his, all the blood work, everything is showing just THC. <clears throat> so I walked him through, you know, different types of things that plant kids are using, or worshiping, or, you know. And we talked about THC and the levels. Um, and he had shared with me that the police officer had found this sticky substance in one of the kids' bags and didn't know what it was. Well, that was um, a concentrate called waxing or dabbing which is at 90% THC levels. Um, and the doctor had never heard of it, neither had the police, okay? The kids are making it here in New Hampshire. People are blowing up their houses across the country making this substance. So um, what ended up happening was the doctor then called poison control, was able to get all the information, um, knew how long or something like that, and could possibly stay in your system, but the uh, President Patrol said, we don't know a lot about this, this dabbing because the THC levels are so high and they use butane to make it. There are so many different reactions. So, you know, that's just kind of your snapshot of what it could be like. I mean, this kid really thought, I'm just going to take a hit and, and everything will be cool. And so I have many stories that I hear in my office with teenagers who are saying, oh, I'm getting high with my friend, and all of a sudden, you know, I start hallucinating, and, you know, they're mixing it with spice, K2, and even, but even just the marijuana alone, 
with those THC levels creates a very different drug. So when we talk about um, marijuana being a gateway drug, which I've heard thrown around here all day, and um, I've thought about like, how do, how do you answer that as somebody who's, I mean, I've been in the field for 18 years. I've worked in Maine, I've worked in New Hampshire, and I've evaluated probably 300 clients from all over the world. And I would say, you know what, it's probably moving towards not a gateway drug, because it's now becoming a harder substance. Okay, so that's something that we'll continue to see as time progresses. Um, the other piece that I wanted to talk about, and you had asked lots of questions about, um, does it lead to something else? Does marijuana? And lots of people have kind of thrown out their opinions and, oh, well, no, yes, maybe. What we know about the progression of substance use is that at different stages, your addiction isn't just you're addicted, you're not addicted, okay? It's a progression, okay? And so what happens at different stages is if the consequences of their, of their use are great enough, <coughs> they would change and that would stop that progression, okay? So there's several different stages. And um, so in each stage, though, are different diagnoses for different stages, and then that all just changed, by the way, so our diagnostic criteria is even different. So it's not just as cut and dry as that. When you look at your bill in particular, when I look at the bill as a therapist and somebody who, I mean, I have heroin addicts on my caseload, I have meth methamphetamine addicts on my caseload, I have um, people who recreationally use marijuana and don't have an addiction to it, and I have some that do. So I've, I've seen the gamut, but in the bill, when you talk about like your consequences as far as kids under age of 18, your fine is is what about what they would buy that weed at? Okay, so and the consequence we may call your parents. You may have to do a drug and alcohol education group. First of all, in, in the different stages of progression, they need different things. So an evaluation has to happen to determine where they're at in their progression. Because some people become addicted to marijuana, some people don't. It's up to each person to figure out if they are or if they aren't. Okay, so I think that people need to really kind of understand those pieces of it. And I want to just end by saying that as far as treatment goes, couple things. Um, somebody, I, I didn't catch the gentleman's name because you're talking this way, uh, had mentioned Maine and the rates of teen <coughs> use lowering because of the, the laws and so forth. I lived in Maine my entire life. I um, treated drug addiction there for 10 years. And I can tell you that their treatment and their legal approach to teenagers far exceeds anything that the state of New Hampshire offers. And with the recent budget cuts, we're even in a worse place to be putting out something <coughs> that had those addictive problems. The main, they have real good drug court systems, they have evaluation processes, the probation officers are very, very tied in with um, treatment therapists, and there's much more funding sources available to them. So if it does progress to a dependence or an addiction issue, they very quickly can get pulled in into treatment um, rather than jail. So we, and in my office, um, and I've been here doing a private practice for eight years, and um, I get lots of uh, reckless driving referrals, um, marijuana possession for the adults to do evaluations, but um, I'm always dry. Teenagers don't get referred. I'm in Carroll County. I am the only duly licensed clinician within 50 miles of where I am. And I do not get referrals for juveniles who, who have had any possession issues or any crimes related to um, marijuana or drugs, for that matter. Um, they're, they're just not coming in. And that's an area that I specialize in with adolescents. So, um, I just thought it was really important that if you're going to make a decision that impacts people's lives like this, you really need to understand all of it. 
It's not just about, oh, this person's going to jail and it's going to ruin their, their college life. The reality is, if you pick up a joint or a blunt or a waterfall in the state of New Hampshire, you know right out of the gate the risks you're taking. That's it. And that's part of what helps me as a therapist is when they know that risk, okay, then they get caught, all right, then I'm in a position to be able to help them so it doesn't progress into something more. And by saying, you know what, you knew the risk, there were the consequences, and that's what motivates people to change. And so you're in a really good position to help so many families and, and adolescents. Um, parents are really struggling with this legalization issue across the country. They're coming into my office saying, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to say to my kid? You know, decriminalization. Great, you can have, what, an ounce or half an ounce. You can have that um, and nothing, you know, you, you're good, it's okay. The parents are, are, you're not really helping them, you know? And one other argument that I've been hearing about is this whole live free or die in New Hampshire. And you know, I wasn't born in New Hampshire, and um, but it would seem to me that why would you then want to jump on the Washington and the Colorado bandwagon, you know, make a decision that's good for your people not what Colorado made their decision that it's good for their people. You don't have the services to support the possibility that these kids and, and even the adults are going to become addicted. You don't have it. And until you do, you think your heroin epidemic is bad right now? Because the reality is, is that not every person who smokes marijuana will be addicted to heroin, but every heroin addict statistically proven has started with marijuana. So, thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon. Um, okay. um, I just have to announce that we only have the room for another 10 minutes at the most because um, Commerce, which is the committee that uses this room after us, needs to come in. Um, I have one other person that has signed up to speak and that is Rich Paul. Your children, because you're politicians and you have money, are immune from the legal system. So just like Barack Obama didn't go to jail for smoking weed, George W. Bush didn't go to jail for smoking weed, Bill Clinton didn't go to jail for smoking weed, because these are rich, connected people. So the fact that, you know, if you all have had children and have run-ins with the law and you've been able to get out of them, that doesn't mean that the plebeians have the same option. Um, really what we're talking about here is the proper role of government. Thomas Jefferson in 1776 wrote that we hold these, right, these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When I smoke <coughs> weed, I am pursuing happiness. It goes on to say that it is to secure these rights that governments are instituted amongst men. Not to protect people from actual harm, but to protect people from having their rights violated. There's a big difference there. For example, if I grow up Muslim and convert to Christianity, I might break my mother's heart, but I don't violate her rights. Um, the fact that someone might have an emotional reaction to your, to your actions is not su a sufficient reason <coughs> to keep those actions um, illegal. A very important thing to remember when you talk about the war on drugs is that we didn't declare war on you. You declared war on us. And just like the Jews didn't declare war on the Nazis, just like the Armenians didn't declare war on the Turks. This is not a war. In war, you have two sides fighting. We only have one side fighting. This is called a massacre. Okay? Even when you're loading us onto the trains, we rarely fight back. Okay, so it's important to remember that this war is a massacre. That means that we don't kick down your doors, you kick down our doors. We don't tap your phones, you tap our phones. We don't steal your future, you steal our future. And that's what you do to people when they are caught with marijuana. You steal their futures. There's been talk about 
um, the increased potency of marijuana. Obviously, that's an effect of prohibition because your marijuana laws say charge you based not on the amount of THC you're carrying, but it includes any adulterants to that THC. Uh, smaller things like hashish and uh, wax are also easier to transport. So just like prohibition caused people to switch from beer and wine to hard liquor, uh, you, uh, prohibition of marijuana causes people to smoke for, uh, change from regular marijuana to smoking <coughs> spice, especially if they're on prohibition. I was, or especially if they're on probation, I was smoke forced to. Uh, to switch to spice when I was first on probation until I decided that it was just too dangerous and I told my, and I switched back to marijuana and uh, then I spent six months in jail for violation of probation, but you know, at least I didn't have to lie to them. Um, the, uh, we talk a lot about spend, sending messages in here and I'm trying to do this like High speed, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, we talk about a lot, a lot about sending, sending messages in here. Well, when a kid start, starts smoking pot, he receives lots of messages. One of them is, "You're now an outlaw. You are now lo no longer uh, eligible for the protection of the state. So if you are robbed, if you're assaulted by the person you're buying weed from, don't call the police." You know. It's just the, this idea that somebody is turned into a criminal, that suddenly they are no longer a part of society, that they shouldn't be allowed to have a job, they shouldn't be allowed to go to school because they smoke weed, makes it really suspect when people say, oh gee, well, people who smoke weed are frequently poor and they have bad educational outcomes. Yeah, being thrown out of school is a bad educational uh, outcome. You know, being screened out of jobs by tests, that's a bad employment outcome. But let me tell you, if there's something wrong with my work, you should be able to find that by examining my output, not my urine. If you have to look in my urine to find the defects of my work, they are perhaps too subtle to be considered. Um, oh, I will... Uh, I guess I will end there. I guess the one, there's one other thing that I will say is that all of these pointless laws, these, these hate laws that are kept on the, on the books against people who aren't harming anyone, uh, they also become very important for government corruption. Um, you know, people, you do have to note that all of these representatives of the police unions that have been lobbying today on behalf of their unions yeah, they want to keep getting the overtime. The prison guards want to be want to keep, uh, you know, being paid to guard people who just smoke weed. Everybody likes to make money, and you know, there, and there, there's another good reason beyond avarice. There's also cowardice. If you're a cop and you're arresting robbers and rapists and murderers, these are dangerous people, bad people. They might hurt you, but a pot smoker is probably not going to put up much of a fight. I mean, he's just a guy who smokes weed. Um, <coughs> on the issue of addiction, uh, marijuana is not addictive in the classic sense in that there are no physical withdrawal symptoms. Uh, you might be a little grumpy uh, if you're not smoking weed, especially if the reason you smoke weed is that you were a little grumpy in the first place. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, it's not the same as something like alcohol, which has severe uh, physical withdrawal. And when somebody is a drunk, when somebody's on, on alcohol and they can't get it, and they're sweating and they're shaking, that's when they're really at risk for moving on to a harder drug, okay? Because marijuana won't completely take that away, although it will ease the symptoms, but, you know, a harder drug like oxycodone, that'll not alcohol withdrawal just like that. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd like to point out is that, you know, a lot of people who get into hard drugs get into hard drugs while they're in prison. Because, you know, they have nothing left. If they're a felon now, they're never going to have a good job again. Just like, I'm never going to have a good job again. Uh, they're never going to go to school again. Just like, I'm never going to go to school again. So 
what do they have left to lose? It's not surprising that when you've stolen somebody's life, they turn to a substance to, to kill that pain. Um, any questions? Thank you very much. Senator Catalo. Just one. Mm -hmm. If you made the statement that if you were a Muslim, you turn Christianity, what would the results be? Probably get your head chopped off. Um, well, it's possible, but that's only among certain types of uh, Islam. And generally, the, in general, the American uh, Muslims don't do that much. It's places where we've radicalized the Muslims by bombing campaigns over the course of decades sorry, yeah, and by sorry. replacing their elected <laughs> government so with not, public so dictators. So that that really becomes a problem. <laughs> Yeah, sure, if I could. We no, had a Mr. Simon, Mr. Maryland, Simon, and every, person, every person who has signed <coughs> up to speak has spoken, with the exception of Ms. Chaffee. Her name was called. She was not here when her he name was called. You, you have Major Franklin did not understand. He had to check the speech box. Major Neil Franklin. Neil Franklin. He's right. a right. 30, 40 year veteran of law enforcement. He right. up here to testify before you. We have to get out of this room, Mr. Simon. We have been here for over three hours. Please, sir, you can submit your testimony. Um, Ms. Chaffee can do the same thing to submit written testimony. We, um, I, I apologize. We only have this room till one o'clock at the, and we have to be out of here before one o'clock. Um, again, he was probably the best person to speak today. He's got 10 minutes. Yes. But the problem, sir, is that they need to come in. The other committee needs to come in and get set up to prepare for their hearings that start at 1 o'clock. We have been here for over three hours. I understand that, sir. We'll be available until 4.15 if anybody has any questions. And, and please, we're not acting on this bill today. So if there's testimony that folks would like to send to the committee, we're more than happy to consider that. Um, but unfortunately, as I said, we've been here for well over three hours. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, he, this individual was not signed up to speak. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you.